have a very full agenda tonight, but as always, we want to be sure that we open this up as we always do for, we're going to skip the liaison tonight um, in the interest of all of the things that we have going on. But as we always do, we open for public comment. Is there any public comment? Yes. Sir? You got to identify yourself, Andy, oh, first. Andrew Friedman. Yeah. Um, and uh, this year will be good. So, uh, my name is Andrew Friedman, as I just said. And I'm speaking on behalf of Becky Lieberman and Alan Roth and myself. The three of us are part of uh, the budget parenting for uh, the high school. And last night, the superintendent gave us a preview of the proposed budget cuts and what they will need for the high school. The three of us were very discouraged by the said by what we heard last week. And although there are many proposed budget cuts, we feel that the following proposed changes will have the greatest negative impact on education at the high school. The first one is loss of approximately four full-time teachers, maybe more depending on our contract negotiations. Um, and the second one is elimination of the college prep from the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Which will uh, which could could lead to a subsequent increase in class size for all the English and math programs, um, and it might make it more difficult for students who are placed up into higher level classes, um, make it more difficult for them, and require more of the teacher's time to assist the student these students, and which may detract from the education of the strong college prep students. Obviously, there's also cuts to middle and elementary schools that will also ultimately have a negative impact on the high school, as well as uh, elimination of funding for the computer for computer technology, such as repairing servers, routers that break down. Uh, we note that the projected school budget shortfall is relatively small, about one and a half million dollars compared to the total town predicted the projected total town revenue of $92.5 million. So we would like to pose two questions to the board this evening. Um, are there options that can be taken to address the fiscal 2018 budget uh, and immediate challenge to close the one point uh, one and a half or $1.8 million uh, school budget gap? And then on the longer term, we were wondering what steps could be taken to develop a more solution to, to address what appear to be repeated shortfalls in the school budget. And then to, in summary, as budget parents, will, we will continue to work with the superintendent and the school committee to help see that our education dollars continue to, continue to be used as efficiently as possible. Um, and finally, we find that almost Universally, other residents that we know say that the quality of the Reading school system was a driving factor to move to town. And um, we all know a number of families now who are dissatisfied with the school system and have decided to send their children to private schools. And we're deeply concerned in the near future that the effect of these budget cuts will, cause, will be a cause for more families to make the same decision. We're asking the town leadership uh, to make it a priority to find a permanent long-term solution to these consistent budget challenges. So, and I'll email you all an official copy of this uh, from, the, from the free budget. Well, thank you. It's very timely, Andy. Thank you very much. It's budget is the focus of our whole evening is tonight. So that's, that's why we brushed it off. So well. Thank you. Um, any other public comment?
Well, um, as I mentioned, um, like an overview of what this is all about, and I think Bob, would you like to pick it up? Please. And the next three nights, um, the town department heads will take turns going over the impact of the FY18 budget on their department. I'm starting with a brief overview, maybe 10 minutes of a presentation tonight. I'll be followed tonight by Administrative Services Director Matt Pernellis. And followed the, uh, following that will be Sharon Angstrom, Town Accountant, to talk about the Finance Department. I'll come in and uh, talk a little about benefits and miscellaneous costs. Joe Huggins, the Facilities Director, will talk about facilities. And I'll finish up tonight with a brief overview of debt and capital. Uh, tomorrow night we'll start out the evening with a badge pinning in the Police Department. And then uh, Police and Dispatch Budgets will be reviewed by Chief Sagala. After that, uh, Chief Burns will review fire and emergency management services. And uh, finally, Assistant Town Manager Gene Delios will review public services. On Thursday, the Library Trustees and Amy Lannan, Library Director, will review the Library's budget. Jeff Sager will review the Public Works budget. And I'll finish up with a discussion of the Enterprise Funds. Um, we may also have some concluding discussion. There's time for that on Thursday. Uh, but just to be clear, um, on January 24th, which is the <coughs> next scheduled selectmen's meeting, there is time on the agenda at the end of the evening uh, for an hour or two if the board wishes to have a wrap-up discussion. You're going to hear a lot in the next three days in a, in a short period of time. Um, we did it this way on purpose because we knew this was going to be a difficult budget year. Um, honestly, if you hear some things tonight that cause you to need to schedule another January meeting, that's one of the reasons we did it this week. Um, I appreciate the fact that the board is meeting for four consecutive nights. It sort of has to break some kind of a record in writing. And I want to start off my remarks by saying that for the first time in three years, our, our official org chart is unchanged from last year. So that's, that's a nice story. Um, and I wasn't sure if the community here or at home would be different than it typically is for budget meetings where this is a tough year. So I thought I'd take a step back and just do a little bit more of an overview than I normally would and just make it very clear that the three uh, beige boxes you see up there are three elected boards. Uh, if you will, they are each sovereign nations. Um, they, they talk to each other, they work together, but they have very distinct and unique responsibilities that is only theirs. The, um, the selectmen in the last couple of years, I'll, I'll give them credit, have given the town manager many unachievable goals, but one set of goals that was achievable was to work very closely with the school department and specifically on four areas in a collaborative manner. Um, because the selectmen all believed that until we could say that our house was in order and we were efficient, um, the selectmen were not willing to ask the taxpayers for an override. So that work wrapped up last summer. And specifically, we worked on technology, HR, facilities, and finance. Um, schools have made really good progress in all those areas. Um, our collaboration ranges from sharing an employee in HR um, to sharing resources and knowledge in technology especially. And um, you know, I can report that the school department's um, sort of internal organization in those four areas is very strong right now. It's very good. Also as a matter of an overview, uh, those that were involved in the summer listening sessions have seen this, but I'm going to do a quick picture of uh, how Reading looks compared to peer communities. We had two independent consulting firms in 2008 and then in 2013 uh, statistically analyze Massachusetts communities. The first thing they both agreed to was throw out the form of government of a city run by a mayor. Um, I hope Rob Dolan's not listening, but mayors are always very inefficient, except for my friends. <laughs> um, so that was the first rule, and you can see, and it's not important that you know all the names of the towns, but you can see geographically a lot of the peers are around us. These are towns that statistically look similar to Reading, and uh, parenthetically, I was up in the northwest corner of the peer communities this morning. I spent the morning in Westford, it was really interesting. Um, you know, to the naked eye, Westford looks very different than Reading, but there are actually a lot of similarities uh, that I learned while I was up there. And the reason, though, those peer communities are important is we compare ourselves not necessarily to individually each one, but to the aggregation of all of them. And as we discussed last summer, I'll just give two quick slides on revenues and expenses. Uh, peer communities, on average, have they, they spend more of their budget from the tax levy than Reading does. 
That, that, that by itself does not mean tax isn't running a high or low, but it just says that peers tend to rent, rely more on the tax levy. Inside the tax levy, it's certainly very instructive to see that we each uh, gather about $54 million from uh, residential property taxes, but then on average, uh, our peer communities collect $12 million more from the commercial, industrial, personal property sector. Um, that was a discussion that's been in front of the board for the last two years, and frankly, one of the driving factors in, uh, in the board agreeing a year ago to go out and uh, look for a, an economic development director, who we hired about three or four weeks ago, um, from funds that are one-time funds, and we hired him for three years, telling him that he needs to fish or cut bait. So he needs to increase property taxes to pay himself. And he's good with that. It's almost like being on commission. The areas that Reading has to rely on since property taxes is not it is state aid. And that's largely driven by the high amount of students we have in Chapter 70 funding, even though our Chapter 70 funding is at a, is at a minimum. And then local receipts, uh, part of that being the dividend from the light department. In terms of how we spend our money, Looking at it really quickly, it doesn't seem like much of a difference up there. You know, plus or minus 1%, not, not really statistically a big deal. But let me hit a couple of highlights. Under public safety, um, the way we do our accounting is not identical to all other communities. Um, our, our ambulance billing takes in about $800,000, $850,000 a year. Uh, that revenue is then shared with the school department. Not every town does it that way. Um, some public safety. Uh, units keep all that revenue. So that largely explains the increase um, above, you know, a, a flat public safety spending. Um, at the bottom of the list, uh, town hall, general government, we are a little bit low. We, we are sp spread a little bit thin at town hall. And as, as what happened uh, during the listening sessions in the summer, probably the most interesting number on the page was education. Um, we spend a little bit more on average as a percent of our funds available on education than our peers do. Um, that is absolutely consistent with the fact that the per pupil spending is low because we have substantially more students than an average peer community does. So we spend more than average, but we have a lot more students. Um, the benchmark to me is always Stoneham, where we have doubled the amount of students for a very similar sized town. And students are the largest, certainly educational cost is the largest portion of anyone's budget. So. Is it a revenue problem? Well, hard to say. Our, you know, we do have lower tax levy. Is it a spending problem? None of these areas are certainly out of control. Can I back up for a second? Sure. So, interestingly, the average peer has $11 million more to work with than we do. Yes. <clears throat> and that's very telling. I mean, you know, to the public comment, um, you know, come up a little bit short, but um, compared to our peers, we're absent um, $11 million. Yeah, and I, I didn't bring the chart, but we used it a lot last summer showing, you know, the average single family tax bill. And much to some people's surprise, the average single family tax bill in Reading is below average of our peers. It was anywhere from five to eight hundred dollars, depending on how you measured it, below average. And um, you know, I'm a taxpayer too. It doesn't always feel that way, but that's what the facts were. Um, you know, a real simple example is North Reading. Their property taxes, on average, are I think twelve hundred dollars higher than Reading. People are really surprised to hear that. A lot of that is their new school. Not all of it, though. Um, again, you know, taxes in Reading by any measure I could come up with, are not high or not above average. But, 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 I just, but on, on that, that statistic that you showed, I think that measured not just what our taxes were relative to other communities, but also one of the, one of the indices was uh, per capita income. Yes. So obviously, if you're in Lexington, you're, you know, your taxes are higher. Um, but in terms of per cap, capita income, towns that have sort of our same per capita income are paying well. So if you if you did a regression of per capita income and tax bills, we were still below we, that regression. Yeah, we were, yeah. We were below, by I think it was three or four hundred dollars. Um, yeah. At least, yeah. 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 And by all means, anyone in the audience or the board should feel free to, I won't even say interrupt, but discuss all the time during this. 
Bob, I want to go back to that slide on the subject of public of the um, ambulance. Um, this is describing oh. that slide there. We're just spending 9.2% on public safety. How does that square with the increased revenues from, we're, we're taking, we've got an ambulance service, we're charging for that. You said earlier that contributes to the half percent. I'm not sure. Um, the 9.2% percent is uh, just above $10 million. Right. Um, so if you were to take ambulance fees and net them against the cost, you'd chop a percent off. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Which would make us below the average in yeah. your community instead of above the average. If that's what yeah. As many in the room know, we had a lot of listening sessions last summer, and we culminated that with a special election in October. And what you're seeing last night from the schools and tonight um, in front of the selectmen are budgets that we described last summer, quite honestly. Um, actually, they're a little bit better because last summer we described future budgets as if no free cash were available, and we mentioned a $3 million structural deficit. Um, I know the schools mentioned 35 FTEs and the town mentioned 10 to 12 FTEs as possible reductions under that scenario. Uh, as it turns out, our free cash regeneration was pretty good last fall, so the Finance Committee in October, November voted to allow uh, 1.2 million of free cash so that the actual budgets in FY18 um, are not as difficult as we had imagined last summer, even though they're, they're difficult. Um, there's been three changes since the financial form that was held in the fall. They are all reductions in accommodated costs. Um, and I'll just go over them quickly. The schools found um, some ways to save out of district special education. Um, we thought that was appropriate that they move some funding into their operating budget since they spent some money in order to save that money. So if you will, they're getting a $200,000 increase in their operating budget. Um, the town um, had some savings in the fuel account. We didn't need all the budget that was allocated. And we actually decided to move that 50000 instead of all the parts of the town budget into the capital budget, which I'll explain later. And uh, very recently, I uncovered the pension funding was about $100,000 too high. Uh, and so we decided, uh, we being mostly the town account and myself, that the best solution, and the superintendent agreed, was to just use less free cash to balance the budget since we had already produced budgets. Bob, how can, how can that, we're sort of behind the curve on pensions, so how do we yeah, find $100,000 more? It's up to the retirement board. Um, they did a one-time change in the current year. It was only a 1.6% increase. They, I had been budgeting for a 4.5% increase, which is what they said we should do. And it had to do with how they count where staff is, where the staff's in the general fund or the enterprise fund. I can't say that I fully either understood or agreed with what they did, but they are the boss. So, you know... Does that mean our pension liability goes down, or does it just means that it, we don't no, have to put it, in as much in any given year? Um, it means our pension liability goes down if what they did was correct forever, because they're counting less of a liability, more in the enterprise funds, less in the general fund. Um, but as I understand it, they do a snapshot, right. which is all you can do when you're an actuary, I suppose. Um, and just to round out the discussion, because um, I know this question's come up, um, me at least. There's been some discussion about we can fee our way out of this problem. Um, as we discussed last summer, that's absolutely not true. Uh, there are some fees on the town side. There's one especially large one, a trash fee. But as we discussed last summer, um, we were not going to, if you will, threaten the community with a fee increase if they did not pass an override, that we would honor the will of the voter and reduce budgets if an override did not pass but that the selectmen mentioned they would reserve the right to look at fees, as they do every couple of years anyways, to perhaps uh, help future budgets. And, and just to lay it <coughs> on the table, except for that one large fee, there is no single fee that you'll find that will even put a dent in the financial problem that the town has. I'll leave further discussion to each department head. Um, some of them, especially in uh, public services, Gene will talk some about the fees. and. You know, when we talk about going from $30 to $50 on a fee that we assess 20 times a year, you get the idea of how much value there is really looking at fees. Not to say we shouldn't do them, um, but you won't fee yourself out of the problem. Well, is it safe to say that, you know, and I do think that we have to look at everything that's in front of us. You know, um, every way that the town brings a dollar of revenue in or sends a dollar of expense out, I think we have to look hard at that. Um, 
in the fee area, and that's come up, I mean, we've heard from a lot of citizens to <coughs> examine that, and I do think we have to. Yeah. Um, is it fairly safe to say that when you look at fees, you really have to look at fees more in a projected way than a current way? So in other words, because of the, of the timing of the fiscal year and so forth. There are Could some. You explain that yeah, there are some fees. For instance, um, you know, for a couple of years over the prior board, we talked about separating the uh, train depot sticker from the trash. I mean, from the uh, compost sticker. Uh, it's twenty-five dollars to do both. It's the best deal in town. Sure it is. Um, the board can still do that, but we've already started selling stickers for this year as combined at twenty-five dollars. I think it would be really in bad faith to change that, honestly, until next January. And that's a discussion the board has every fall, is, you know, you pretty much got to decide by October, because otherwise you're changing the whole program. And how can the police enforce something if you have all these different sets of stickers mm -hmm. to try to enforce? So that's one possibility. And as you know, you'll hear from the chief, there's not a whole lot of money in that to begin with, but that's a different discussion. Mr. Chairman? Um, otherwise, I think it's fine to have a fee discussion you know, that would be in the near term, but again, you'll see the impacts are not high. Like building permit fees, you could raise them any time. So we be sure we earmark part of that time on the 24th to talk yes. about not only fees, the idea of going back for the lower dollar amount override. I want that discussed okay. by the board. Too. And as a final thought on fees, it's just important that the community understand <coughs> the town is not allowed to charge a fee just because someone would pay it. The town, by law, must charge a fee that's commensurate with it, what it costs to offer service. So if, if we offered uh, square dancing at the senior center and people would pay $10,000 for it, we can't charge that because there's no way you could justify that as a cost. So in the background, sometimes that's a hidden discussion um, because, you know, you think, well, you know, this is my alternative. I would gladly pay that. The town has to be able to justify through some accounting method that the town accountant will scrutinize Yes, we can charge that fee because it costs us that. We can't make a profit on a fee. Well, it seems that that's designed around the idea that, you know, citizens vote there. You know, I mean, the, the, the tax revenue flows in a prescribed way by law. The only change to that tax revenue is by, by vote, by override right. or um, by debt exclusion. And so I, it seems to me that that probably connects the dots on if you don't get a tax increase, right. you can't really create a tax increase by arbitrarily <coughs> picking a number for a fee. Is that That's correct. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yes, yeah, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but I think some of the fees that have been sort of discussed publicly and, and on here are standard fees for service that other towns charge that, you know, are easily justifiable um, by just even looking at some of our peer communities. If you look at the parking Parking, for example, if you happen to live in North Reading um, and you drive to the Reading Depot to take the train into Boston, you're paying four dollars a day at the MBTA lot. That's a thousand dollars a year. So you know, I'm not saying we're going to charge two thousand dollars a year, but certainly a discussion that charges somewhere south of that, but more, but north of twenty-five, to me seems you know. I do think just that discussion. Yeah. I think that you know. We need to earmark plenty of time on the 24th to turn all the rocks over yeah. in that regard. And, you know, and I'm not suggesting you shouldn't do fees because it's some kind of a, a mask for new taxes, because I, I, I don't really believe that. I think that, I think we have to, and the law prescribes this, we need to look at how we can charge fees that actually match up to, you know, what, what a cost would normally be. I mean, and I, I think that's true. I, I know there was some examination of that in some of the fees that the uh, school department w was levying as well. Yeah. That, you know, um, the law is pretty clear. You know, you, you need to, you, you can charge fees that match costs, and then you take the fees in and you spend them on costs. I mean, it's, you know, and I think it's notable that when the town takes in a fee, we take a hundred, correct me if I'm wrong about this, Bob, but I think when we take in a fee, on the town side of the accounting, we take 100% of that fee and bring it into our general revenue account. And then when that's redistributed, the way that we've been cooperating with the schools and the school committee is that 
even though that would be a town fee, 100% of it would come into the revenue stream and 66% of it would go to the school and 33% of it would be retained. Do I have that right? Um, that's accurate. I mean roughly, I, I know that. Yeah, it's, it's correct as a philosophy, there's been very few exceptions. Um, one year the board voted to raise ambulance fees in order to help the fire department with a specific reason. Right. But yes, generally that philosophy is exactly right. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes. Three questions. So on that same topic, that is not always the case on the school side though, right? For example, athletic fees remain within the... I think it's generally never the policy on the school side. Okay. The second point is the nice aspect of fees that I find is that the burden falls upon those that use the service. That is, it's a user tax, if you will. And that way it's driven by those that benefit, if you will, from parking or trash pickup or whatever it is. So the one aspect of that that is attractive is while there's a cost, it's, it's levied on those that get the benefit of that cost. The other part of the discussion on the 24th, I think, has to also be the cost of that revenue. These, these proposed changes don't come free. You've got a tabula, you've got a measure, somebody's going to track, chase down the exception. So there's a cost of cash that goes along. Yeah, it's not just as simple as fee right. in and suddenly that <coughs> paints itself to a bottom line number. Right? Of course it doesn't, you know, it definitely doesn't do that. No, but there, there, are certainly, there are certainly things that you can do to look at that from a cost yeah. standpoint because that's obviously one of the biggest things. And it's great that you're taking this X amount of dollars, but there's a cost you that X amount of dollars Somebody's to take it in. Well, you have to understand yeah. what the there's net. There's definitely ways to look at that, though, I think, from a, you know, to, that aren't as, you know, uh, apples to apples, so to speak, when it comes to those dollars. Mark, you had a, you had a question. <coughs> Thank you, John. Uh, Mark Doctor from Precinct 1. Um, and sure, clients, I think this is actually a very important area. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it um, for one of the meetings. But um, there are a lot of fees at this point that aren't necessarily um, at the appropriate level, necessarily covering costs. I'm not sure I completely agree with this, not just what the market will pay. I understand the restrictions as Could you repeat that the last cost. sentence? I didn't hear that. In the statement here, the last statement on the board, fees must be justified through analysis of cost of services, not just what the market will pay. I think Barry brought it up also that there's an opportunity cost. If other communities are charging certain things, if there's a market rate for doesn't matter. ambulance. doesn't matter. Well, That's state law. So that, that would argue then for parking, we can never have parking. We need to justify whatever fee we want to charge for parking. The MBTA does not need to justify their $4 under the same rules. Right. But so if North Reading had a station and they were going to charge four, they would have to justify that. Right. I think, I guess my point is this. I think that there is justification that can take place. I think this is an important area for us to look at. Yeah. Um, it's been kind of a, perhaps a, a, a little bit of a give back in some cases to the to the residents. I think it's important that we take a look at it. This well, it needs first. to be identified, isolated, and then understood. Right. You know, the cost of a, there, to John's point, there's a cost of a fee. Nothing's for free. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you right. got to really, and I think that, you know, the sense I have from Board of Selectmen is no stone goes unturned here. Yeah. And that, you know, we really need to get into, I mean, at the end of the day, there's arithmetic going on. But it's not, it, it isn't rocket science, but it, it does require that we really peel the layers back in order to be able to understand it. And I think that this, this time more so than other times in the past, perhaps, the 10s and the 20s and the 50s and the 100s, can start to add up. And I think, you know, to your point, Mark, you know, it'd be an interesting look to look at things, okay, if the state's telling us that it's not just what the market will pay, and it's things in regards to cost, you know, what does it cost for a parking space for the town to, to, to keep that parking exactly. space? You know, that's one way to kind of look at it from a monetary standpoint and say it costs us X because we want to keep it at the highest level. So therefore, we're going to charge Y for it. When so there's, doing, there's probably a ways we can really look at this. When you're doing this kind of budgeting, Kevin, I, I, I agree that you do have to really tear it down and understand. Yeah. You know, and there's, I'm, I'm hopeful, uh, I'm guessing that we will hear, since we're doing such a thorough examination, I mean, there's a certain cost to what we're doing right now. I mean, the cost of nighttime government, for example, is, high, yeah. is not free. Um, and so these are things that we've always assumed were just a cost of doing business. And they are a cost of doing business. But, you know, as, we, as you look at as you look at how money gets spent, these are this is one of the things we have to look at as well. Um, so to turn the lights on in this building, to have the staff um, that needs to be compensated one way or the other um, for their time in nighttime government. I mean, well, 
you know, the selectmen volunteer their time, the CONSCOM volunteers its time, the Board of Health volunteers its time, all true. But there's some, there's some soft costs involved, and, you know, there's a pretty big pile of soft costs sitting in the room right now. Nighttime uh, so double is not free. Yes. <laughs> and we do need to, I think as part of the analysis, we really need to understand how we spend the money, because we owe that to, you know, to the people that write the checks. Which are, the, which are the citizens. I'd just like to make a quick comment on the fees must be justified by a uh, thorough analysis of the cost of services. Um, I think that you ask, you could ask, maybe this is an overreach, but you could ask 10 different accountants to justify the cost and they'll come up with 10 different ways to justify it. So for example, say for parking fees, or um, you could you could include the cost to maintain the roads um, in, in, in as part of that cost. I, Andy, I don't disagree, and I think all of that needs to be. I mean, I don't think that if you're going to increase the fee, you want to necessarily make it the smallest possible fee. You want to make it a fair fee right. that actually encompasses all of the potential costs <coughs> involved in how you arrive at that number. So you know, the one thing you can't do is just look to market forces because we're not that kind of a business. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. so here's the uh, draft town manager's budget in front of the selectmen. And again, for the folks at home, um, schools in the town are a little bit different in the sense that formally the superintendent <coughs> creates a budget that then goes to the school committee. The school committee then votes a budget, they approve a budget with or without changes that goes to the town manager. On the town side, um, the selectmen are advisory to the town manager, but ultimately it's the town manager's budget. And I, I do listen to you, trust me. <laughs> but just so people understand, it's not parallel, exactly equal processes. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's the town manager's responsibility under the charter, regardless of what the school committee, the selectmen, or the superintendent have said, to balance the budget. So that's why we involve the finance committee early in, uh, in, in the fall and understand what our available revenues are and have a target of spending. And much like the school department, um, you know, the, the town is looking at a 1.4% increase next year. That's what available revenues allow. And at this point, I have to thank the school committee and the school department for donating the facilities department to us, because for the second year in a row, they're the most expensive department, um, <laughs> between 45 and 5% uh, costs next year. But as Joe will describe, they're, they're good costs. In terms of staffing reductions, as we discussed last summer, uh, the town is a little more expense heavy than the schools, certainly they're more personnel heavy, so it hits us a little less on the staffing. Um, but there's seven and a half uh, FTE equivalents uh, in that list, and I won't read the list, but we had to eliminate $300,000 worth of cuts. And then um, in some cases we had to put some of it back. So for instance, when we eliminate a firefighter or a police officer, it's only logical, unfortunately, that we have to add some overtime back in because we know there'll be some cost, even though we can't predict exactly what it'll be. Um, so the net, you know, the net of the seven and a half FTE reduction is about $280,000. And each department head will go into quite a lot of detail on that. Uh, question on that last one? Yeah. Why the uh, ratio, the disparity ratio between uh, the overtime for police and fire? It looks like it's five to one for police, a little over three to one. Um, where are you looking, Dan? I'm, di I'm dividing 65,000 by 20,000. Oh, okay. I guess the shortest and simplest answer is minimum manning on fire. No. When you when you lose a firefighter hour for any reason of time off, there's a much higher probability you will, okay. by contract, need to replace it. You need to. Okay. I thought it was important, um, especially as the town manager, to talk about the management team. Um, no stone unturned, we're saving $126,000 by changes to the management team. Uh, that's through two, two basic changes. One is we're eliminating one position, and the other is some employee turnover in a couple of key areas where we saved money for the first year. But you know, this is not something that I ever really discussed with the Selectman or the public. I think it's really important to bring it up now. Uh, Reading has only eight department heads on the town side, which is very low compared to peer communities. That's not something I have stats on. Uh, but I can tell you from talking to other town managers, 15 to 20 is much more typical for department heads. 
Um, in addition, not every town certainly, but some of our peers are much more deeply staffed. Um, in Reading, the department heads are scarce and they have to do actual real work. Um, so that a cut to this uh, management team is a significant one. And, and I laugh sometimes, and the selectmen will appreciate this, uh, when someone at, will ask me, uh, how much of your time is spent on management? And my answer to that is, as little as possible, because I have real work to do. <laughs> and every department head could say the same thing. There's actual work that department heads must do, no one else can do. And that's just a fact. That is not true in many other communities. They are supervisors, they are managers, that's what they do. We have to do that as well. So I thought it was important to just show that we are also taking a look at the management, if you will, and making changes as best we can. Bob, I have, I have a question on that. I remember when, when you first became town manager, one of the things, you, you looked at the org chart, and one of the things that you prioritized was trying to find redundancies within departments, because if somebody, especially more on the town side than on the school side, where someone's been in a job for 25 years and that person decides to retire or go elsewhere, they take with them, you know, 25 years of institutional knowledge that no one else may have. And, and I remember when you reorganized it, you tried to find a way so that if something happened, there was someone else to kind of step up and there would be kind of a dual, you know, dual control, so to speak. Um, you know, the fact that we have eight <laughs> department heads and you cut it a little bit more, are you sacrificing any well, of that? The one reduction was in the, the one single department that had two assistant department heads, the biggest one, Gene's department. So now we just have one. So we still have that redundancy. It's not nearly as good as it was, quite honestly. And that and was through Patricia? Yes. And, and as Gene will tell you, um, people with lots of knowledge try to leave the organization. They may even formally retire, but they're never really allowed to totally leave. Well, just yeah, just seeing in your in your budget write up, you have two retired uh, exactly. folks doing work for us. So, right. I guess in Reading you never retire. Um, no, <laughs> I guess we to. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but you will hear over the next couple of nights uh, less hours of service to the public. Quite simply, uh, the library will describe the loss of Sunday hours. This building will close uh, 260 hours weekly, or not weekly, but over the year. That, that'd be a big change. That'd be a trick. <laughs> um, particularly as, as the assistant town manager will review, there will be less than staff participation in community events. And I'll, I have to tell you quite honestly, some of the community events may not be held without staff uh, involvement. We'll have to see. And as we mentioned, and as again, Gene will go over sort of with statistics, um, you know, the involvement of staff in nighttime government is very high in Reading. Uh, everyone in this room is here for free, but that's not true of other employees. Uh, management is, does not get overtime, but other people get overtime <coughs> or overtime. Well, in regards to nighttime government, what have you ever looked at the amount of? Uh, and I'm not saying it's, it's a bad level one or the other. Just curious, the amount of committees and boards we have, nighttime government, as opposed to our peer communities. Um, I've done that, but not sort of mathematically. Um, you know, what I, what I discovered in looking at websites without going out to the town and talking to them, the websites can be very misleading. And I'll, I'll use an example that I think I found in Wakefield. Obviously, I can visit them, and I, and I do frequently. Um, they list groups on their website as a committee of the town that are not formal committees of the town. They're a group of citizens that do something interesting. And they, so they list them as a resource, but they have no involvement with the selectmen or the employees other than a group of interested residents. Hmm. So that's why it's a little hard to measure, because you can't just go on a website and look and figure it out. Right. Um, I would say that, in general, our volunteers, we have a high amount of volunteers and they're very exuberant about it. Yeah. And if you're looking for a fee to impose, I think volunteer fees would probably help balance the budget. <laughs> I said that once, and a certain <laughs> committee was not appreciative. Converted wages, you said. Exactly, exactly. Converted. A fee to serve. serve. Yeah. yeah. I thought we had that. <laughs> <laughs> it's called your time. <laughs> um, also, it's important. You'll see a budget in front of you. You'll see some specific changes. But what you don't see is, honestly, um, in the parlance of the schools, um, where level services are. And I've just thrown one example out there. Um, you're going to see uh, Chief Sagala uh, talk about the elimination of one patrol officer. Um, as we mentioned last uh, summer, if an override passed, we would have added two officers, so there's a change of three. Um, we also discussed that 
you know, with the size of the override, which was large, that we asked for, we would be able to do things in the next three to five years frequently for other departments as needed. And we fully expected to be able to hire another officer every three to five years. Um, I will tell you right now that my impression is we're somewhere between four and eight police officers understaffed in this community. <coughs> we last did a staffing study almost 15 years ago. Um, the town was very different 15 years ago. The world was very different 15 years ago. Uh, we are not at the staffing levels recommended 15 years ago. So just think about that in police. Um, so it's, it's really easy to look at a budget, look at the changes, and, and bemoan the changes. Um, you know, something Dan mentioned uh, to me a, a little while ago is to do a zero-based budgeting, and that just doesn't work in the public sector. But the philosophy it is, of it is really important. If you were to start a town government, where would you start? And that's, that's a personal question that, honestly, all of us here would have slightly different answers for. Um, but I think it's fairly universal that police are, you know, an assumed cost, that you want to have some amount of, you know, of a police force. And, and the truth is, in Reading, we don't have... You know, heavy staffing. We just don't. And as you'll hear from all the other departments, um, many divisions within their departments are similar. Uh, we're doing the work of more people than we actually have. This is the simple solution. And I'll just conclude by saying that I, I make the same comment every year and I'll make it next year. Uh, as always, we will all strive to meet the expectations of the community with whatever level of resources that are made available. And that's by definition true. Um, but as some of the department heads and, and most of the selectmen, and I certainly know, um, there'll be a lot of very satisfied residents, but the trend of unhappy residents is increasing. There's just no question. And that'll be true of both the school and the town side as we eliminate services that they've come to grow used to. Um, Reading has a lot of things in it that other towns don't have. I, I really don't want to pick on any of them because that will feel like I'm singling them out. But we have positions and we have services that communities around us do not have. And I have discussed those services with the department heads and with residents, and they all want to keep those services for as long as possible. Um, this budget does that. This budget is difficult, but it does not completely eliminate services that are unique to Reading, I'd have to say. Um, that day is not far away, though. That day is coming. Um, I've also had a lot of discussions, as you know, the board have with um, newcomers to town that are new to the town within five years or so. And a lot of them chose the town. Um, the comparables are often uh, Andover, Winchester, Reading, for whatever reason. And Reading was chosen because it's a high value town. You get a lot of services for what it costs to buy a house and parenthetically what the property taxes are, which really wasn't the decision. Um, that's an imbalance that cannot continue. Our, our low amount of property <coughs> cannot support the services that they thought they wanted as if it were Lexington. Uh, the average home in Lexington pays over 12000 We're about 7000 We probably do a reasonably good job in value in, in bridging some of that gap, but we are not Lexington. We never will be. Um, and that's just something that's going to become clearer this year and in future years, both in the school and the town budget, just as we said it would last summer. So with that, I'd like to turn over um, the balance of the night to the department heads, starting with uh, Matt Cornelis, our Administrative Services Director, and now Ombudsman. Mr. Chairman, just can, I, can I ask one more question to Bob before you yeah. leave the podium? So I know the last, over the last few years, we, we sort of looked at doing uh, budgets, not kind of year by year, but sort of looking into the, into the future a little bit. So um, as dire as this budget is in terms of cuts that are made both on our town side and the school side, assuming no other revenue um, sources, whether, you know, the, you know, fees or potentially a smaller override, what does 19 look like in terms of, can you make any predictions in terms of what, what's going to be lost at least on the town side? Yeah, or, or at least in terms of how much less money we have to spend? Dr. Doherty and I spent actually a fair amount of time over the last few months talking about FY19 of all things. Um, if you recall, um, during the summer, both of us said, and the public seemed to understand and appreciate, that our number one concern was employee morale. In order to des deliver services the community wants, you have to have good employees. And so if you don't have good morale, um, you know, we saw a flight out of Reading a, a couple of years ago and had 20 or 25 vacancies at one point. People just nervous about the financial condition as an employee. Um, so I made it a priority, and I know John made it a priority, 
to try to minimize FY19 personnel reductions so that we could both say to our staff, this year will be the most difficult year for personnel changes. So if you made it through this year, your chances of making it through 19 are much better. Now, nothing's perfect, and um, you, know, you never know what the future has, but as you've seen from my budget write-up, um, if my look at the future is accurate, and we can cut our expenses as I think we can, uh, we may not have to make very many layoffs at all in FY19. About it. I can't speak for, for John in that in the school side, but that was a priority to be able to tell our staffs after this, things are okay for a couple of years, and then maybe there's another crack uh, going back to the residents with an override. But we felt we both had to take a two-year look at budgets for the first time, really, in a while. And that's assuming we have one and a quarter percent this year. That assumes one and a half to two percent next year, which is probably realistic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just say before you go on that, if anybody has a question or a comment, in order. This is not the normal setup for RCTV and for everybody to be able to hear. So if you have a question or a comment for any of the speakers, I'm going to ask that you please stand up because the sound system works better and uh, the question can be acknowledged better. Okay. Okay. Thank you. My name is Matt Prinellis. I'm the Director of Administrative Services. And before you tonight is the Administrative Services budget. Um, just by way of background, there are actually five divisions in administrative services. Operations, town manager's office, human resources, technology, and the town clerk, which also consists of elections. Um, overall, I consider my budget to be level funded. We actually have a decrease in wages <coughs> and a small increase in expenses. And so I thought the best way to do it was to just sort of walk you through the munis sheets so you can, I can highlight a few things and if there's any questions afterwards you can ask about that. So we start with operations and the operations division uh, consists of procurement, communications, constituent services, also shared staff, and we have postage and equipment um, <coughs> maintenance in that, in that department as well, centralized division. And the, the first um, main cut I wanna highlight is to the operations specialist position, and that's what we were actually talking about before, where it's actually staffed by two former Reading employees, now retired, the mm -hmm. former HR director and the former town accountant. So they're just working part-time on special projects. So we're proposing to cut that from 40,000 to 20,000. Um, what that will do is it'll mean canceling certain technology integration projects that we were going to be working on but we, were, we will be able to preserve some other projects by keeping the line funded. So we didn't zero out the line. But even with that, re, uh, that cut, that would be a reduction of one half of an FTE right there. Um, as we move down, still in operations. This is on here. Um, yeah, pay and class is the, is the next one I wanted to talk about. Um, that's a $23,000 cut. Um, what that would mean is that there would be no pay in class increases in FY18 at all. Um, we would consider that to be uh, half of an FTE as well. And um, we did have that money left over, but we thought it best to, to cut that given the financial situation. Um, it's not the best cut to make because employees do count on that money every year. and. Um, it could have an effect on morale, and it could also have an effect on um, where we stand with our peer communities, but that was a uh, cut we had to make. We're making a small cut also to the temporary help that we use. That's mostly high school students that we use um, in the summer and a few hours during the week, so we're making a 15% cut to that as well. Um, the, next, the next department is actually the town manager's office. Let's put it up here so we can see. Um, the town manager's office consists of the selectmen, finance committee, legal services, and property insurance. And the highlight there is actually there's going to be a small increase or $20,000 increase in the legal services budget um, for town council. Uh, we made that increase because that's the way the line seemed to be trending this year with legal services. It's also a very valuable service to have. I say that being an attorney myself, but you know, to, to give the little plug there, but it's also something we use a lot. And it's something that every department depends on. Um, so that, uh, that line item needs to come up. 
As we move to human resources, which would be the next department uh, division that I'd want to talk about. Um, if I can get it up there. Human resources. So human resources uh, provide support to the towns, the school department, the light department, and retirees. So it's, it's much more than just the town. We actually uh, deal with four different units there. Um, our human resources director, uh, Judy Perkins, is here tonight sitting out in the crowd. She's also my assistant <laughs> department head. The only real change we're going to make there, we're going to ask to make there, is a cut to the HR professional services. Um, that cut would be basically because we're not anticipating as many assessment centers this year, and that's where that was paid out of uh, under the assessment center line item. So. We used it a lot last year with some um, police and fire vacancies, including chief and deputy chief in both in both places, and also some promotions. Matt, a quick go back on the Law Labor Council line. Sure. Yep. So you, you've got that budgeted at 25k this year, and proposed to leave it flat. But the run rate in the past couple actuals has been well below that. On the on the 25k. Well, this year we're going into though union negotiations. So okay. That's for labor. Very good. All right, that answers the question. Um, They're also planning to review all the contracts. Yes, I knew that. Thing. Contract review and negotiation. So we're going to need that more. Right. But yeah, you're right. During the usual year, we don't use it as much. So while we're there, right? The TLT litigation. You're not forecasting anything, mm -hmm. and I, I'm certain that we haven't seen the last of the bills. <coughs> Don't those end up at the town site? Yeah, I would expect. We, we have not been billed since June for the school's council. We have been billed by the town's council. Uh, the town is current through, I think it's November, uh, schools through last June. So no question, we will be going to April town meeting with a request for TLT litigation funding, which I know I mentioned at the TLT special town meeting. Um, you can see there's a small amount there year to date. What is it? Six grand or eight grand, I can't really read that. Grand. We're not forecasting um, anything because. But, but it should be wrapped up this year. I mean, whatever money is owed uh, needs to be told to us by April Town Meeting or too bad. You know, the service was rendered this year, it needs to be paid this year. And so that'll find its way not through the budget, but through a special request. Of yes, at, at April Town Meeting under the FY17 budget article, I'm sure we'll be asking for funding. Because I'm, I'm certain there's a large amount of. I'm certain it's I'm large. Certain also, a large amount of. You know, yes. Attorneys' fees. Chair. Mark, ask one more question. Yeah. Mark, Mark Dr. Um, on the legal counsel line. So just to be clear, the town council's mm -hmm. TLT expenses are not in that line, right? They're separate. They are in the town council line. They are in that line. We okay. we account for it and we know what it is. Okay, but, but it's we in that decided line. it should still be okay. part of town council. And with all the zoning you've been doing, all those expenses are in the town council line also. So my question is, is are we really trending toward 180, or are we going to have less TLT, less zoning? I was wondering, do we need to bump to 180? No, we don't seem to be having any less zoning. More zoning, right? <laughs> <laughs> More zoning. And the, yeah, frankly, that's a function fun. also. Of, I mean, you know, CPDC last night, you know, was marching towards some recommendations that are really surrounding economic development. Um, economic development theoretically spawns additional revenue. Right. Hence, you know, you don't want that to slow down. Right. I mean, you really, I mean, actually, if that exceeded budget, in a longer term look, it's probably a good thing, right. actually. This is revenue up spending. It's not cost spending. I mean, this is one of those variable yeah. expenses that, yeah. I mean, yeah. you kind of, I know this is going to sound odd, but Fixed expenses you want to maintain and manage. Variable expenses, you know, connote that they're running next to revenue, and therefore you want them to run. Um, you know, not necessarily stagnate. Yes. Um, Mark, I don't know. I don't believe I've ever shared with the finance committee the analysis of legal services, but I'll do that at your next meeting. The selectmen see it every couple months. There's a lot of categories. There's projections on rates of spend, and so you can have a look. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, the next uh, division that we have under administrative services is technology. So as you can imagine, that centralized computer services, telecommunications, internet, audio, video, software, computer support, mapping. Um, in 
In technology, we're actually asking for some increases to expenses this year that are needed. Uh, the first increase would be uh, for the line item $40,000 increase to upgrade our Microsoft <coughs> 16 software. Right now we're running uh, Microsoft Office 10 and it's causing some compatibility issues and it's, uh, it won't be long before we really have a problem there. So the technology director has asked us to actually purchase the, the next version of uh, Office. Uh, further down, we also are asking for a one-time $30,000 expense to acquire several rugged uh, field tablets for the DPW. Um, that would increase productivity in the field um, as they would be connected as they're out working. Um, so DPW has asked for that and we've included that. You know, technology obviously services all departments. Um, so that was a that request there. And the technology director is asking for a one-time $10,000 expense to upgrade our firewall, which is in need of upgrading, and is also, as you can imagine, very important. We wouldn't want to let that lapse. Um, the Russians are the <laughs> I didn't say <laughs> North Reading. <laughs> North Reading. North Reading. Um, <laughs> They'll be for the Russians. As we move to the uh, town clerk's uh, budget and elections, so the town clerk's office covers elections, voter registration, census, town meeting, licenses, historic documents, document storage. Um, the changes in the town clerk's budget, we are asking for a, a small increase in an expense of $15,000 to continue our electronic archiving that we've started and has been a very useful tool for us to preserve a lot of our historic and, and legal documents. So we're asking to continue that. And we're making a, a major cut to election workers um, and that is, it's really because there's fewer elections coming up in FY. Uh, 18, but it's a $50,000 reduction in election workers, and we do consider that to be a, a, a reduction of 1.5 FTEs. So um, the clerk's office, those are the changes to that budget. Um, a, a couple of side notes, a couple things that aren't, you don't you won't see in this budget, um, things that I would like and have asked for in the past. Um, one thing would be the, the town clerk's office currently shares an admin with the finance department, and it had been in the look ahead to have an admin, um, full-time admin in the clerk's office exclusively. That couldn't be funded last year. It can't be funded this year, but in talking to the clerk, it would help with customer service and getting through backlogs. And also, one position we didn't fill again this year, although we would have liked to, is a software coordinator. Um, that would... Um, Right now, we divide up the software responsibilities between a technology and administrative assistance, but this person would actually centralize it. It would centralize training, um, integrate a lot of our systems together. So we can't afford that this year either, but that would be another thing that would be needed. And actually, the real last thing is the LaserFish software we use to um, put all our documents in electronic form and have on the website and available public records. That's in need of, a, of an $80,000 uh, increase at some point, but it's not going to be funded this year. We can still use the existing system, but the town clerk has reminded me that in the future this is something we're going to have to we're going to have to deal with. So, so that's basically my budget in a nutshell. If you have any other further questions, I can answer them, or we can move on to finance. Sure. Matt, I have a question. Yes. Oh, yeah. On the um, on elections. Um, yeah. You know, this year um, with the federal election, we had the first time we had early voting. Yes. So, and I know for two weeks you had people at town hall. You had to feed them. You had to, you know, pay them. Yeah. Um, what's the? Um, how much did we get from the state for that? And I'm assuming it wasn't nearly the cost of what it cost. And what was the shortfall? Yeah. We anticipate. I know it's only on federal elections that we do that. Currently, so is that every? Yeah. Would that include just the presidential? Is that the Senate? Um, I, well, I think it's every, it, it could be actually, they, they're talking about changing it to even more frequency, but um, every, I think, it, definitely every presidential election, and I have to check on whether it's the federal election as well. I think it's just every four years now, yeah. because clearly a discussion that was so successful. Yeah, they, they're recent. talking about increase, so it's hard to tell right now, but right now you can count on the president's right. presidential election. So what was the difference between what it cost and what we got back from the state? I think Laura said three or four thousand dollars, it's not a huge number. Yeah. And for the convenience, I'd say it was pretty, pretty worthwhile. Mm -hmm. I think that, okay, forty-two hundred. That's what it sounded like. And it probably cost us a lot. Well, and it is mandatory. <laughs> I did have to buy pizza for everyone in line. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, 
Yes, um, just a question about the software upgrades. I know it's not a huge part of the budget, but right. a lot of these, uh, like Moon up Microsoft 10, yeah. um, a lot of these uh, software applications now are available online and freeware and function very well. Um, and you don't have to pay for them, you just download them. Well, we do, we so do purchase licenses. So I was wondering if you were, were Consider that. Yeah, I mean, we, we do purchase licenses, and, and we yeah, and we um, we have to do things you know by the book, you know, especially where we're in this municipality. So where that option may be available to other people, not necessarily available to us. Um, what we're talking about is is um, Microsoft Office. You know, the latest version would be 16. There's actually a version 13 that we never upgraded to, so st we're still working off 10. Um, but I mean, we could look into the other. Other ways to do it, but generally this is the way we prefer to split. If I can add to that, um, in discussions with the school department, primarily and to some small degree with the library, um, the school department particularly can get deals that the town does not is not eligible for. So, generally speaking, I'd say the schools pay ten cents on the dollar of what the town has to pay for the same thing on software because um, there's educational discounts. However, the penalty for us using anything bought with an educational discount on the town side are severe. Oh, so we have to be really careful. Yeah. And we also have to be really careful, as Matt said, making sure we're always licensed. Um, we're a big enough organization that software companies will come after us if we don't behave. But as myself as a resident, they're never going to care. No, I'm not talking pirated software. Yeah. I, I just to know share. that there's open source software yeah. out there that does very well. It does, but the feature set never matches the completeness of the Microsoft <laughs> Office set, in my experience. Uh, it, it never does, feature for feature. You can find the features. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's improved a lot. Yes, Mark. Matt, can you, yep. back on operations division, yep. um, business admin on page yeah. six? Yep. So this like took a bounce. Uh, two years ago. Is that because maybe a person left and wasn't replaced? It went. Yeah. I'm looking at um, Ops Business Admin. Yeah, that was 67, 74, then 43, and then 80. Is that, did we not have a person for a while? Right, I, I guess it was vacant. Part of this predates me here. Um, it's currently filled. It's the business administrator. At one point, that was um, somebody that had actually worked down at the police department doing some of the same uh, functions. Um, but now we have somebody there full time, and that would explain why. So that's the bomb. Okay. Yeah, it was Thank it you. was vacant. And, yeah, exactly. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Go to, um, it's 20 to 22 in your um, packet. If you go to the end, you'll see that the <coughs> overall increase in finance is 1.8%. And the main driver for that increase is basically salary increases. Um, there are all non-union staff in the finance department. There's 12.3, I think, um, FTEs in the finance department. And they all qualify for um, the recommended um, step and pull that increased the um, Bob recommended, which is one step, 2%, and 0.75% COLA. All the other items seem to stay, we have them flat, we're not increasing. Um, but there is a couple small increases here in the professional development area for like $100, um, and that's the area where I would draw from. And I will be um, renewing my CPA license next year, so that will be very helpful. But that's basically the only increase, with the exception of in the, um, the assessor's department, this 3.1% increase, that is actually our regional assessor. Um, he is actually an employee of Wakefield, and we have an agreement with them, and that increase um, is based on that contract. Everything else within the department is flat in terms of expenses. The only increase
increases we have are the salary increases and that um, regional assessor. Um, and we did not have any staff reductions in finance. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, first off, um, we are a shared service department, so we do the finance for the entire town, including RMLD. Um, so there's a lot of volume to what we do, but we also charge indirect costs back to those um, enterprise funds for our salaries and our expenses. So a portion of what are, is paid out of finance is actually charged back to enterprise funds. So if you were to cut a person in finance, you're not going to get the savings that you would think because money is coming in from other departments to help fund it. The other um, key area is the volume of what we do and the nature of what we do, and that is not going away. It's very consistent volume. Um, so, for instance, we do the payroll for the entire town, including our monthly, and that's a bi-weekly payroll on average is about 1,200 employees that are being paid. Um, we collect all of the cash for the town, either indirectly or directly. So most of the payments are um, collected directly by the collector's office and process is being hosted. And in some cases, we are collecting turnovers from departments for their fees, but then they still have to be verified, approved, and posted. So I think last year we had 128,000 cash receipts that we processed through our office. We pay all of the AP invoices for all of the um, departments, including our MLT, and that was 29,000 payments. So just as a, as a point of curiosity, it sounds like your department, if anything, picks up an intensity in oh, yeah. times like this. I mean, in fiscal 18, we have the senior um, tax relief program that we're right. in place. We did not add any additional staff and we will absorb. Well, so that, that is really where I was driving. So I know that we've got that change coming down the line. Mm -hmm. And, we, you, know, it's a, you know, it's legislation that we went after specifically for, you know, for a very important reason and no staffing increase. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk a little bit about, since you handle all the revenues, um, if there's a change in fees, for example, mm -hmm. now you just gave me some ridiculously large number of transactions that you That would increase, uh, you know, like it. So, how many transactions are you handling? Well, for instance, the cash receipts was when I looked it up 129,000 cash receipts were processed just last year, 29,000 invoices, and then we pay 1,200 employees every week, mm -hmm. bi weekly. And each of those so, for example, in the fee area, um, we'd have to consider the cost of fees. They could increase. Fees. Or they could decrease. I mean, if people stopped using something, a fee <laughs> yeah. that we had, you exactly. increase it, we might actually see a reduction. So it could go the other direction, depending on what it is we're increasing. But you'd be handling more volume, yeah. I guess is what I'm saying. Our volume seems to be very consistent as I looked back over the last few years. Um, stays at the same level or, or a little bit higher, a little bit low, but in the same vicinity, not a dramatic change. You know, I, I think, Sharon, I, I don't want to speak for the rest of you, but I think um, on the 24th, Bob, are you, uh, are you, I think I'd like to invite you. What is the 24th? On the 24th. You don't have to invite her, you can order her to come on. <laughs> yes, I'm your employee. <laughs> and I say that because as we start to, you know, really try to have a, analysis discussion of you know revenue and expense um, not like this but in a more philosophical way I think that there's real value in having someone like you at that in that discussion I, I'm guessing you guys would probably yeah. agree with that um, and at least be available to us absolutely okay so the volume and the nature of what we do does not decline based on our financial situation that we find ourselves in. So to cut staff here would really be painful for us because our volume is not going to go down. Um, we have 9,000 parcels and, and the assessing is doing all of that. The building is still going out. We're still collecting all that real estate tax. All of that stuff still has to be done and I don't think anybody would argue that they want any of that to go away. You don't want to not collect the money. You don't want to pay the bills. You have to pay the payroll. Um, and so. Our functions are not something that we can stop doing, I guess is my point. Um, and we are, in fact, going to do a little bit more in fiscal 18 because of that senior tax relief. Yeah. Um, but our assessor assures us that he thinks that, you know, he can cross-train some of our collectors to, to oversee these applications and see if we can determine eligibility and do it without adding anybody. And hopefully we can. It's the Reading way. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, so I think um, 
We can get a lot of volunteer help from the senior. Uh, we could probably get some tax workers to assist yeah. as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So I didn't have a whole lot to share. So if no, you have that's any questions. meaningful. <laughs> yeah. um, I think you're good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Bob is, Bob is back. Bob is back. Let's see. I'm, I'm going to quickly go over uh, benefits and sort of miscellaneous costs. Benefits is clearly the most important part of that. And I'll drill down into health insurance a little bit. Where are you? Page 58 of your handout. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the retirement assessment is not going up four and a half percent next year and it actually didn't go up four and a half percent this year even though we thought it did so you can see the actual is about a hundred thousand less than what we did this year so that'll be one of the budget amendments in april town meeting we, we have an extra hundred thousand dollars which we do not need going forward what page did you say that? page 58. yeah the munis number right around there. so if you look at i'm looking at the munis page 58. Yep. i think it's 60 as a document All right. So if you look at retirement assessment, it's, yep. it's only going up 1.6%, and the rest of it's fairly boilerplate. Worker comp, not a big change, very small change. Um, as you would guess, because of the FTE reductions in the school and the town side, it's only right to increase the unemployment budget. Um, every time we lay off a significant amount of staff, that's a pretty significant cost. Okay. This should handle that. Yeah. Um, Here's health insurance. 7.5% uh, is what FinCom allowed us, if you will, to say. I think it was 75 But I want to share with you an interesting peer community study that we did. This might be a little hard to read. No, it's not too bad. Um, there's our 25 peer communities. At the bottom, you see an average. Uh, at the top, it's a little harder to read, but it's annual spending. And I think importantly is, and this is the latest data that's available from the state, so we looked at the period 2007, which is the earliest data they had to 2014. And annually, Reading's actual expenditure, no monkey business, actual expenditure is up 4.2% health insurance. Um, annually? I annually. I dare say that in the private sector, that would be outstanding. Right. But when your revenues are going up 2.5 or 3%, this is bad. <laughs> And that's, that's one of the problems we have. <coughs> but you can see Reading is really is doing okay relative to our peers. Right in the middle. Um, you know, four and a half percent is the statistical average. I still think North Andover was doing something funny to have a reduction. <laughs> I don't know what it was. Well, I think they must stop paying the I mean, they went from 9,000 to 6,000. They must have just uh, laid off like two thirds of their workers or something. I don't know. Um, but even allowing for that, uh, you know, we are below average in our run rate. So that was good. And the, the employees work hard at this, actually. Yes. Um, we have to negotiate this with a, a, the PEC. Um, it's all the unions of the school department, the town, and the light department that collectively bargain with the town manager. Um, we've, we've had a historically good relationship. Um, effectively, we're 71, 29% partners on the same problem. Uh, the town pays 71%. The employees pay 29%. Uh, that's also a, a slightly um, high figure for employees relative to our peers. Our peers are still closer to 25%, although they're, they're climbing up. They used to be down below 20%. They're definitely climbing up. And at 29, we're still ahead of almost every community. Yeah, yeah. So this also includes the buyback feature that we have Correct. to choose a spouse, uh, a spouse's so we've done ours. that, I think, for three years or maybe four years. I think we've saved about half a million dollars. Does that sound right? So we're paying some employees not to take health insurance. It's like paying the farmer not to farm corn because it's too much How many corn. people have actually taken what, to pay that? Do you know how much a year? Is it like 15 it's a year a or something like that? Yeah. Maybe it's more. Yeah, so that so it, let's say it's 35. That's just to remember that's a split between light department, water, sewer, stormwater, and general fund. So it's not all a savings in the general fund. Well, this is a blended number. That is this number on the screen instead of that. This is only general fund. This is only general fund expense. Um, but that that program has reduced our cost. 
Um, for those that are not familiar, we effectively, with, you have to meet certain parameters. If you've been on the health insurance for the town for two or more years consecutively, and you have a spouse uh, that has an alternative plan that is recognized under federal and state law, we will pay 25, roughly 25% of the savings for them to exit the Reading plan to go on to a spouse plan, and we keep 75% of the savings. So that's um, something that few communities have done, but it's becoming increasingly popular. Um, you know, it's, it's not a good long-term solution to the health insurance problem, but it's a pretty good short-term solution for Reading. Yeah. Can we increase the splits and get more people? <laughs> um, we've talked about that, and our splits are a little bit higher than the few peers that do it. We did increase it from a, a roughly 20 to 25 percent, and we did elicit a little bit more interest. But generally speaking, I think that, that 75 25 is about the right place. Well, you got to redirect the cost. You know, I mean, you're, you're, there's added cost to the family when they, you know, it's from one pocket or the other. So they have to, you know, they've got to show a net gain right. in order to make that change. I would, I mean, I wouldn't make that change unless it was a net gain. So, um, and in, as a percent of the budget, I, I hadn't run it off this chart, but I had run it here or two before. Uh, Reading spends about 10% of its budget on health insurance. Uh, there are some communities, not necessarily our peers, typically cities, that spend 20% of their budget on health insurance. So although health insurance is, a, is obviously a national problem and a local problem, in Reading it's not as bad as it could be. The problem is we have a relatively comparably low baseline expenditure, but that does not mean that our annual increases are also well behaved. Um, I have not heard a formal number out of any insurer for next year, but informally I'm hearing the GIC will be above a 10% increase. I would expect our health insurance plan, Maya, will be something very expensive, although I, I don't know where. Um, it, it's such an impossible area to predict. We, we do have good relations with the unions. Um, we used to be able to have bells and whistles available to reduce premiums. Honestly, at the federal level, two and a half years ago, those bells and whistles all went away. Uh, no one knows how to price health insurance anymore. It's not an actuarial science anymore. Um, we used to be able to say, well, if you change your copay for the emergency room to, from $50 to $200, yeah. you'll save a quarter of a percent on your, on your premiums. No one can say that anymore. They don't know what the cost of health court care is. Is that why the premium line is, is up as high as it is? Well, we don't have the tools to combat it anymore. So for many years, we, we did a, we basically pushed costs onto employees, quite frankly. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars got negotiated, if you follow Dan's earlier comment, onto the users. Right. So the more you used health insurance, you know, we had those that use it the most pay the most. And again, it was collectively bargained. Everyone agreed it was a good idea. Um, we would still, we would have the appetite to do more of that, but those tools don't exist right now. Yeah, it was easy. There was a time when it was easy to have a discussion around how those tools worked. They don't. There's no uniformity to the way that those tools work anymore. They're, they're kind of all over the place. So yeah, the I'm guessing that's not going to change. The only tool that we've heard of. Um, a limited network um, is out there certainly in the private sector and one has been offered to us but just as an example um, children's hospital in Boston would not be part of our health insurance anymore and so when I say that I don't mean the copay would be worse I mean if you go to children's hospital you are entirely on your own so that's also a philosophical discussion as an employer is that the right thing to do to our employees if suddenly one of their kids gets sick and they have to go to children's is that position we want to put our employees in. People come all over the world we've generally, the hospital. Yeah, we've generally decided, no, that that's, that's not responsible. Yeah. That's not being a responsible employer. But that's the kind of sort of outrageous well, choices you've you had in that right down the street. There are some of the, some of these blended approaches to self-insuring as well um, that are... Yeah, Judy's talked about that. Be, she comes from that background. You know, and they can create savings, but there's a certain there's element a of risk too, yeah. because you're there's a certain element of what you're self-insuring, and so that can dramatically change your premium inflow. You know, so you could have a three-month cycle where it's X, and then it's X in a multiple for a six-month cycle. Our pockets aren't deep enough to take I, that out. Mm. You'd be you'd be amazed at the businesses that are 
rolling that dice just because this yeah. expense has gotten so big. That's right. Yeah. It's a it's a risky proposition. Yeah. And I, I don't think it's one of municipality should embrace. We don't or at least look you can look at it, but I can understand what the back end is too. Yeah, and the and the back end for in my mind for municipality is you can't go bankrupt. I mean, technically you can, but that's not a realistic option. Whereas if I were running a company, I'd be willing to roll a dice and say, hey, if it doesn't work, we close. Yeah, no problem. Um, but really the bottom line here is that Reading has done a pretty good job in health insurance, better than our peers, and 4% doesn't sound bad. It's bad. You know, given our revenues, 4% well, is bad. Well, it's bad when you have a 2.5% growth rate on your revenue. It's, yeah. You know, and it becomes one of your major expenses. What do we pay? What, what's our cost? Well, here it is. It's almost eleven million dollars yeah. next year in a hundred million dollar budget. So again, it's right around ten percent, and and it's growing faster than any other expense. So it's going to go up as a percent, and it's it's a national problem. Yeah, I mean, and I don't mean to throw my hands up and say we can't do anything because we we try, but no, but the expects. the exponential impact of that over the next ten year cycle, for example, when you, you know, a lot of times it just gets back to arithmetic. I mean, it's it's that simple. Um, the runaway of that, um, it ever increasingly becomes a bigger share of the total revenue package, particularly when the revenue package can only grow at two and a half percent. So, yeah. Um, that really wraps up uh, benefits. There's nothing else interesting, but you know, benefits at a run rate of almost six percent are, are clearly a challenge for the town. Uh, you saw all the other numbers. You know, kind of not that far away from zero. This is the challenge. Again, the Finance Committee has a, I guess I'll say an informal policy that we budget a certain amount for an increase every year. We have two cushions if it's higher. Uh, the first is the FinCom has said that they will supplement with additional free cash uh, any increase that's higher than, let's say, the 7.5% we budgeted. But it's also important to keep in mind that we have budgeted 500000 a year for OPEB, um, other post-employment benefits. That's retiree uh, costs. Um, and in theory, it'd be a bad idea, but in theory, we have a $500,000 cushion that we could use against a spike in health insurance for any given year. But, but that really brings in the. That's just, that's just exacerbating a problem. Well, in the I was going to say that brings into a, another discussion that really does sort of bother me. Um, the town is not doing a very good job or a perfect job on its long term liability. And other towns, and in fact, almost every town in the past has gotten into problems with pensions because they didn't fully fund their pensions, right? It was pay as you go. So their workforce was accruing future pension liabilities, but they didn't worry about that. They just paid out the retirees that left. And eventually there became a huge gap in corporate and, you know, nonprofit and profit America, where pensions became an out of control problem. We had a lot of pension reform, both for the public sector and the private sector. Um, you know, pensions are important. They were protected at the federal level by a lot of, from a lot of corporations that went bankrupt. Um, but corporations and municipalities have an obligation to fund their pension fund fully. Right. So you see, we're paying generally four and a half percent a year in pensions in order to fully fund by, I don't know, 2029 or whatever it is. And then we'll drop down a million and a half or so. We won't need to do that catch up. Meanwhile, we're sitting here and we're not fully funding our other post-employment benefits, our health insurance for retirees, which is mandated by state law. It's not like we can't do it. So we're funding 500000 a year in the general fund, and we know the real cost is somewhere between a million and a half and two million a year. And we, so we know we're underfunding now. And we have a growing pool of retirees who have happily the prospects of living much longer. <laughs> yeah, yes, so, I yes mean, indeed. You stop to think about again. We try to read it. Really <laughs> it's um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm not happy that we're not fully funding it. The light department mm -hmm. is, is paying theirs. It's at a 20 year schedule, I think. 18. And the water, sewer, storm water are also funding because they don't have Prop 2.5, quite honestly. Right. We can't afford to. Yeah. I'd like to. Um, but, you know, are you going to lay off teachers and police officers um, or are you going to? do this and that's a hard question you know we still do have 500,000 in the budget it's a drop compared to what we should have um, but it, it is always an available option to fund something uh, when does the OPEB liability show up in our balance sheet now 
Do you know what it is? Is it 80 million or something? 67 million? It, it is moving on to the balance sheet, or already has. Okay. Well, it used to be a note in the back. Now right. it goes to the now front. On. Yeah, I mean, that's the... So our, our balance sheet now shows, like, you know, Red, red alert flags, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you know that yeah. we're technically bankrupt. Yeah, we're really not, and 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 the uh, the rating agencies understand that. Yeah. But the reason why they took it out of the notes and put it on the front is exactly what you just described, is yeah. so that we don't forget about it. But to our benefit, we or to our credit, we haven't forgotten about it. We put in as much as we can um, over the years, and. Um, you know, compare. You know, from quoting our auditors, is that we're in better shape than most, and we have a better commitment than most of, of, of the other clients that they work with. So, you know, we're trying to do the right thing um, as much as we can. Bob, one quick go back on the insurance premiums. Do we have visibility? Maybe probably don't to the loss ratio by the carrier, or to how much of that premium is kind of think of it as a risk premium on term of the future. Versus actual payout. Surprisingly, we actually have all that. They give it to us. Um, I'm not sure what I should say in public, but we're not a very good customer to have. Said enough. We're not a very profitable customer. We're a nice customer, though. So there's not much of a risk premium built in. Right? Yeah. Really not, not for the current insurance plan we have. You know, we've been there so long, they know us really well. So there's not a level of unpredictability, and that's not something. Um, if there's no other questions, I think we'll turn to, was it facilities next? Yeah. <laughs> I was holding the question. Back to the health insurance for a second. So our current system is a PPO-based plan, not HMO? Both. It's both? Yeah. Okay. So the only comment I would make is that in industry today, the common practice is to offer different types to different people with different premiums. PPOs are much more expensive and HMOs are less. Um, so if we in fact just have PPO, that is kind of more on the high end of things. And maybe at some point worth reviewing, offering, having different options available and see what we can do with that. So I understand the Children's Hospital dilemma quite well. Um, but d depending on you know, in the past we've looked at all the options. There's a fellow we work with at Maya that's, I'll call him an actuary. I'm not sure if that's technically right. But as, as you deal with finance people like that, they're not capable of lying because the numbers are the numbers, so they can't lie. So he's really good. He's really an interesting guy to chat with. We've kicked a lot of ideas around over the years, and they introduced what was called a tiered plan. I, I won't take this too long, but um, they thought that a tiered plan of rating physicians in hospitals level one, two, or three would fix everything. And let's just say it hasn't at all. Um, and as soon as they did it, they priced our PPO and our HMO, in my estimation, far too close together. And we told them that. So we said, all right, so we, do we have to do your job and price them apart to make people want to choose the HMO? And he said, no, it's not going to matter. They're going to become the same kind of plan because it's the tiering that's going to influence pricing. So three years down the road, he says, okay, you were right. Tiering didn't work at all, and your HMO and your PPO are too close together. What do you want to do? <laughs> that just shows you he's an expert. That's his business. Um, so you know, to your point, it doesn't seem as though there's a big in a, in a normal world, yeah, there, there is. is a big disparity. Right? Yeah. It sounds like that's not what we're experiencing at all. So, um, you know, when you look at, again, we could spend hours on this. You look at the lack of transparency in the medical community, it's really hard to know. If you're going to go get an MRI, it's hard to price shop. It really is. And you feel like you're being disloyal to your doctor when you say, I'm not getting that one, I'm going over here, it's the same equipment. Um, it's certainly true, and generally speaking, that PPO services, the same service is more expensive as a PPO than an HMO. So that it's better if you were to go through that service as an HMO. Um, that is true. However, the market is not pricing premiums that way for reasons I can't begin to understand. They're going to pay for service with doctors instead of the cost of service. You know, the result of the health of the patient. Um, you know, 
health insurance to me is a 20 hour a year hobby to try to figure out what to do. Uh, so I, I don't, I appreciate the fact that it's very complex, but I don't understand why there aren't more creative solutions. I, I really don't. And I, I guess it just goes to show you that it's so volatile and unpredictable that you can't study with math right now. Uh, and maybe at some point you can. Don't know. So we try to balance our financial exposure with our obligation as an employer is the fairest thing I can say. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> um, one more. One more. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, we're going to do it. This, is a, this slide you're looking at right here, similar to last year, where we put up our mission statement and a department overview for the facility department. Um, presently, we take care of eight school buildings and nine municipal buildings within the town of Reading, total 1.1 million square feet of uh, usable space. Uh, we maintain, manage a staff of uh, tradespeople, an electrician, plumber, and a carpenter, and we outsource the remainder of the trades uh, to, to perform the mandated state inspections as well as, well as the preventive maintenance program in all of the town and school buildings. We also are in charge of 23 full-time custodians, contract including at the high school and the Coolidge Middle School and the four town buildings, the Reading Public Library, Town Hall, Pleasant Street Center, and the police station. Last year I mentioned um, some of the technology that we use to manage the buildings. The first one up there is Maintenance Direct, which is our work order system, which allows users in all of the town and school buildings to enter work orders that come into our office and where we dispatch to the different uh, trades. Uh, and we track uh, how much we're spending on equipment and where our time and resources are going. Uh, Facilities Direct um, is, utilizes a schedule school rentals and invoicing. That position is a school department position, but that gentleman works in our department and does all the rentals for the school facilities um, within the town. FS Automation is a new one that we mentioned last year that we were going to be rolling out, and we just rolled that out last fall. It ties the rentals in with the energy management system at all of the uh, school buildings and soon to be the town buildings also. What will happen now is if we rent the space out, such as the Performing Arts Center at the high school, and there's a rental going from 6 to 10 at night, it links itself with the energy management system to occupy and unoccupy the space. We're already seeing savings by doing that. Um, we're better control. There's less steps that need to be taken to you know, give the, the, um, the users uh, conditioned air or heat or whatever it might be. Critical alarm automation is another feature we're using. Uh, which we monitor all the uh, key points in the energy management system. Uh, it sends out alarms uh, via email or text. If we have a low water temperature condition, a boiler that's gone down, or uh, a low temperature in a wing of a building. Uh, it also produces a work order and dispatches somebody. So that's a real key uh, feature right there for loss. Uh, Utility Track Plus is something also we talked last year about rolling out that we just rolled out um, in the fall and we're now track doing a much better job through this program tra tracking our utilities and our consumption um, where, where our spending is and um, where the costs are going across all the utilities in the town and then obviously the energy management system which I which I just talked to you about which has we have controls at every building energy management controls at all buildings except for the DPW garage Sure, two quick questions to the sure. discussion on fees. Is there any linkage that you know of between the cost of some of those uh, heating, lighting, ventilation, air conditioning, and the fees charged? You probably you may not know. I'm just curious. The, the, the rental fee is based on the amount of money it costs to run the building per hour, and it is broken down to that level. And this is all on the school side, so you may not have the same on the town side. Correct. It's on the school side that we have the use of school property that we that uh, renters uh, pay into, and then we pay back the for the custodial fee to chat if it's an overtime detail, for instance. But these monitoring tools apply only to school? We'll get, right now, we're using the, these, everything you're seeing right here is utilized fully, except for the um, FS automation, which we're going to start using that to rent the, rent the spaces on the town side. All right, good. Thank you. So that will be happening in 
coming into this next year? That's the plan. Yeah, we've discussed it with the superintendent. Um, because that is a way to manage the soft, understand the soft. Yeah, it's and, not necessarily and manage it's it. It's also a philosophical discussion between the three elected boards <laughs> as a fee policy on room rentals. Right. right. Um, and that's that's a big discussion, actually. Yeah. Um, it's not often the three elected boards sit down and talk about something like that that's not a budget, but that is. Because um, yeah. I think there's demand. Oh, yeah. And, and historically, I'll say generally speaking, the room rental fee on the town side has been really low. And the library, what is it, is 10 bucks for four hours? We'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> no commitment there. But, yeah. You know, I would say it's a fair statement. I'll, I'll leave the library out. On the town side to say we're not covering our costs of room rentals. I'm sure of that. Yeah. But now we have an ability to start figuring that out. Before it would have been a bit of a gray area. It's still a philosophical discussion. Though. Yeah. I mean, you know, certain things you want to encourage. Yeah, because the building is going full steam, and it's nine o'clock time to get out of there, right? right. But right. Um, up until that point, it's yeah, we're open a lot of hours a week, so yeah. it's that. It might be interesting to add to that, that discussion. I mean, necessity is the mother of invention. We have a need. This might be an interesting opportunity to get into the discussion around harmonizing rental fees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I just listed some key department functions. I touched on a few of them, maintaining the work order system and managing workflow, performing the routine maintenance repairs for all the buildings, managing support preventive maintenance program, which is a big item, provide project management, collaborate with the permanent building committee. We do long-term long planning, coordinating with outside contractors, follow state mandated inspection schedules, capital planning and project management implementation managing custodial service for all the town and school buildings and manage and track energy and fuel consumption for all 17 buildings. This might be a little difficult to read, but this just shows you um, the amount that the, there was 2,400 work orders that we did over the course of a year. And it just shows you the times when these, there's, a, there's a large spike, like right here in June, where we had, I believe over on the right-hand side, it was like 14% of the total work will happen in June 16, and that's when the school year ends and we get really busy with work orders, and that's when we have a lot of work, project work going on in the buildings. And then again over here in September, when the kids come back to school, we get busy. When teachers come back, there's a lot of work requests that go on, stuff that might have got missed that, you know, wasn't put in a end-of-year repair list or what have you. So. This just gives you an idea. Hear from you at Christmas time, though, right? Right. <laughs> right. So it just gives you a general idea where 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 it's all happening. This just show, this is the org chart for the facilities department. Shows you myself. The we have an administrative secretary, assistant director, our maintenance technicians, town custodians, and the cleaning contract. And on this. School, there's a school facilities manager who's in charge of the 23 custodians and the town, the school cleaning contract for the high school and the Coolidge Middle School. And like I mentioned, we have the rentals coordinator who handles all the school rentals that's paid by the school department and event technicians, which are students. This next slide here is again, this is just more of what I've talked about last year. It just gives you just a general overview of all of the buildings in the town of Reading, the year they were constructed, the year that any renovation took place, the use, and the square footage of each location. The two newest ones being the Matera cabin and the cemetery garage at the bottom. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about the capital projects that were completed. We did a, this, is, this first item was in coordination with the town, school technology and the town technology department, which was replacing the UPS battery backups in the server room at the high school as well as the data center at the PD. 
Uh, we did Main Street uh, fire flooring replacements. We did police station carpet replacements. We did some uh, carpeting over at the Killam. That slide over to your right shows the high D area out back, the media center, with new carpet installed with high visibility uh, edging on all the edge of the stairs. Uh, we did a um, kitchen, an epoxy floor replacement at the end school. Uh, we did more carpet replacing placement at the Parker Middle School, same at the high school. We did a main entrance door of the DPW garage, which is a neat replacement. And we did a lot of sidewalk repair around the high school. The projects that are remaining to be completed are uh, some upgrades to the HVAC system at Wood End, as well as the, uh, an upgrade for all the town buildings that have the Honeywell control package in them. We're going to be doing an upgrade to that, as well as a new roof on the West Side Fire Station. These will all be done before July. So what's the uh, upgrade on the uh, Wood End HVAC system? We're going to be installing return air fans in that building. Um, because of the way that building is built, it tends to it does overheat over there. Oh yeah, it definitely does. Yep. <laughs> and what we've talked to our controls contractor as well as our uh, um, HVAC contractor, and we'll put some return air vents in there, which will get a little bit more outside air coming into the building. So then on a, on a warmer day, it'll be able to modulate the outside the temperature in the building better. We have we had installed exhaust fans in the atrium up really high about seven years ago. It helped, but and we have some fans in the rooms. But this should take the curse off. That's the hope. Okay, is, is, it, is it a taxing problem in the system itself? The HVAC system is the heat. It's just the way the building is designed. It's, it's, design. it's just the design of the building. Okay. Some special projects that we completed within our budget. Um, we, as every, we all know about the LCCA. The Lead Contamination Control Act, we had uh, several schools affected by that. We completed those repairs um, for the elementary schools largely. Uh, we did some Barrows, at the Barrows Elementary, we did some soffit work um, over there with some new vents. We completed roof inspections uh, for all town and school buildings, which helped us build our capital plan. Uh, we did interior painting at all the schools last summer. We implemented a utility track, as I had mentioned before. Did some ceiling fans on the fourth floor of the high school. Uh, we did an LED light conversion, and we took advantage of a rebate from Reading Municipal Light um, last last summer, I believe it was. And in, in the first, I believe through December, Kevin, correct me, it was about a 10% savings in our electricity consumption over there at Eaton. We replaced about 135. Um, fixtures in the hallways over there at the Eaton, and it made a huge difference. Um, we're also, just a side note, we're going to be taking advantage of the Community Compact uh, Grant. Um, we're going to be doing some more uh, work, possibly a town hall for the interior of all the common area lighting, and take advantage of some LEDs over there also. That'll be happening soon. Joe, at this point, are there any other um, problems that are quarantined because of the, uh, the lead issue? Mm -hmm. No, they're all addressed. There's nothing that's quarantined. Well, at, at the Killam, we are using, uh, it's hand wash only, and we're providing uh, drinking water for all the kids over there. We've been doing that since the kids came back to school. Is that containment, or do you expect to correct that going forward? That's part of a larger right. renovation of that building to fix that problem over there. It's not, a it's not just in the fixtures. It's, like it's in the pipes. It's in the pipes. We finished the town hall exterior painting this year. We did half of it the year before, and this year we finished the outside of the building. It was the... Uh, the annex that we finished. Uh, we did some work in inspectional services, some renovations of some offices over there. And that slide shows you the DPW. We expanded their break room over there and renovated uh, their kitchen, which was in, they were in dire need of it down there. And we did painting in this building right here. We painted the inside, um, the entire building. This was done two years ago, but the rest of the building was completed. And we did the outside of this facility. Um. This just gives you a sort of a breakdown of the amount of in-house labor hours that we use for some of the larger special projects, um, how many work orders, and the average hours per work order for some of the bigger things, just to give you an idea where some of the work is going for some of those larger ones. That chart on the, gra uh, on the right there shows you where the work goes. Uh, I guess it's by craft or by trade. You know, boiler, carpentry, clock spells, custodial, 
custodial equipment repair, energy management, doors and hardware, electrical, 247 work orders for our electrician. That's, a, that's someone we hired uh, two years ago. We were outsourcing that. We brought that in our department and we're saved quite a bit of money. You, and very rarely do we call the outside contractor unless it's a really large job. So he's busy every day. He's busy every day. Like yeah. the HVAC's pretty busy. Yep, the HVAC. That'd be something we would love to be able to bring a trade like that in, but it's really it's outsourced. It, it's, yeah. outsourced it's so specialized. It's, it changes all the time. Yeah, it's difficult. Um, plumber too. We have uh, we have a master plumber. plumber here that works for us also. Yeah. Good to see Pest is only thirty-seven. Yeah. <laughs> This just gives you a, an idea where the work orders went by location. And obviously the high school, you can see 429 work orders up there. Um, Barrow is 161. You know, the town buildings is less just because, you know, they rep it represents much less square footage. Um, but that's where the work is going. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. It's our newest one. Yeah. You stop to think about it. That maybe it's not as shocking as you might think. It's, uh, it, and it's, it's and really it isn't. Solid. It doesn't all, it doesn't necessarily mean the amount. It all breakdowns too. It could be just work requests that our people are putting in too. There's, that, there's a further breakdown behind that. Okay. You know, it could be delivery. It could be custodial. It could be you know. It's, this this chart fluctuates. The high school is always going to be the number one. Right. It's 370. Well, I mean, just space wise, yeah. it's just we don't have a major issue with, with our newest elementary school, though, right? No. <laughs> no. The way it reads up here. No. Nope. No. Nope. This is just a purpose uh, summary fiscal two, 2016. Just gives you an idea again. This just breaks it down even further into like critical alarms. I'd I'd spoke to you folks about okay. uh, facility schedule, general grounds, general maintenance. Just gives you an idea where we're where we're going every day. Joe, these are reports you get out of the tools you described earlier. Yeah, this is from Maintenance Direct, which is one of the modules we use uh, through School Dude. It's called. And are these independent tools, or is this kind of a suite that we get? It's a suite. All these are part of that whole package. Okay. Yep. So this is this one right here is this is a um, this is part of utility track right here. And what we did here is did a thirty month um, thirty month energy usage for I believe this is natural gas consumption over here. So you can see over over the thirty months for 2014, 15, and sixteen. And you can see where we're, tr where we're tracking right now at the high school, which is the largest uh, consumption user. We're in pretty good shape. This next slide, that just shows you the boiler room at the high school. Is it a two Cleaver Brooks boilers we heat the building with? Shot primary heat source. So in addition to at tracking the consumption of the single fuel source, this next one's going to show you all three utilities, water, natural gas, and electricity. And I, don't pay any attention to this in the bottom because this is a partial year. This is when we were learning how to use the product. But this just gives you an idea of what the cost profile looks like. And here we are down here. So we're tracking pretty good year to date right now. How are you tracking cost of fuel? Are you putting in cost every month? We're putting in cost and we're putting in consumption. Every month. So is the cost every of month. natural gas changes your upgrade tool? Yep. It really tells you where you need to go next. If there's a maintenance issue that's We've caught a lot of, us. we were doing this manually before, and I remember a few years ago we had a, uh, our, our, um, our water bill spiked really high at the uh, Coolidge, yeah, yeah. and for no reason at all, other than it just went through the roof. It was up like 30, and we had a steam leak under the building. So if you're not watching it, you're not tracking it, you would have not, it never. Manually, there's almost no way to keep up with it the way you Correct. Yeah, and we're just we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg yeah, right now. These tools are exceptional. So you can almost predict kind of even make a capital plan off of this sort of like you know 
what's wearing out faster, maybe? Um, the one we use for that is the work order system because we track what we're spending on repairs. And if we see a piece of equipment that's getting to the end of its useful life and it's a repeat offender and it just keeps costing money and throwing money into yeah. it, that's when we track it, you know, on the capital plan. We took a lot of things off the capital plan. Our capital plan is a lot lighter than it was 10 years ago because of the uh, performance contracting initiative we did. So as far as mechanical equipment goes, we're in really good shape. So we're scheduling PMs off this as well? Right? Yep. We, it, I, I, um, I mean, I could have shown you all that. I just wanted to give you an idea. But the um, preventive maintenance module also spits out every month we get PMs that come out, tells you which which uh, the boilers are ready for it now or the um, rooftop equipment or the chiller at the town hall so we that's automatically generated and our vendors get that and they come in and do the uh, the regularly scheduled pms and our boiler is a single fuel at the moment right you don't have any dual fuel no no So here's the town facilities budget right here. We're just showing what our salaries were this year, 2017, and the request for 2018. And I believe that's up. It's five percent, and that's a one. There's a um, there's an increase for salary as well as a five thousand dollar increase in overtime. It's a one-time expense um, to cover some painting projects that we're going to be doing. Um, on the town side with in-house and outsourced to try to get the most out of it. And custodial services and supplies is, is level, and uh, that includes the town cleaning contract for this building and the three others that I mentioned earlier. The core facilities represents a 2.5% increase. Maintenance expenses in this line right here is equipment for the facilities guys for tools. Uh, some consulting fees are in there, and that's just up a small small amount right there. School repair expenses. I, I lumped this number all together. There's a lot of detail in my budget, but I thought it would be easier to show it this way. Um, this is level for, for school repair expenses. This includes extraordinary repair, um, maintenance repairs, and then regularly scheduled PMs. It's all rolled into that number right there. So, Joe, when you get to the bottom line and you're, and you, you're forecasting at 2.5%, obviously that's the number you need to live inside because mm -hmm. theoretically that's the revenue stream that comes. Mm -hmm. um, is it, would it be hard for you to identify what's missing because you have the constraints of two and a half? You follow what I'm saying? In other words, I'm guessing that some of these are, that you forecasted a budget tied to what you have to work with. Mm -hmm. Actually, makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so the question becomes, what aren't you doing? If you had one more dollar, where would you spend? Yeah, there, there would be things I would probably. The, the things that we miss out on are the aesthetics that that people like to have, which is like painting. We fund that usually if we have if we have a surplus in our budget. Um, we did that within you know and last year because you know things like carpet um, paint inside of the scene that you don't have to have it but it's a nice to have right um, you don't want the buildings to get totally beaten down it's a public buildings people come into them every day where we try to control our costs is is the, the biggest it's a moving target is the utilities budget where we we control you know when we occupy the building how long we occupy it and that's we so we that's where you're really managing it that's it's oh, like yeah. And that's that's, biggest, the software that's our biggest number. That's your biggest number by that's a lot. That's our biggest number. And the software is helping to that. It is helping. It is helping. We look at it every day. <laughs> so that total down there represents a um, a five percent increase, and it's largely due to um, an increase in utility costs, electricity, natural gas, um, town repair expense went up by sixty thousand dollars. We're going to be doing some work at the police dispatch. Uh, here at this building, we're going to do some work up on the second floor, finishing the job, I'm going to say, which is carpeting and some uh, furniture, and then over at Town Hall doing some painting on the inside. But that building has not really been painted in 20 years. We've done bits and pieces in the last 11 years that I've been here. 
and that's the bottom the bottom line number right there, yeah. just under three. Talk about the utilities, it doesn't make sense immediately. Is you could get an increase due to price or an increase due to consumption. I assume uh, consumption's down because you're using modern lighting, for example, and modern modern boilers. So are you saying it's all price driven? It's all the cost of the fuel? I know there's uncertainty, it depends on degree days and all this other nonsense. Yeah, I, I think you're asking a complicated question, particularly because we have a new library. Yeah. So library aside, that's probably a fair comment that consumption is not up. I won't say it's down. Mm -hmm. um, but remember, some of the buildings are in use, um, you know, 24 hours a day or at night at least. So even though there's more efficient ways, it's not necessarily the building is used less. Right. Well, the year over year with the library example is, yeah. I mean, you know, that was off in a rental location that, yeah. you know, it's really hard to manage, you know, the, not hard to manage, but it's a whole different look compared to what's going on today. Well, the well, library's well, open now, and it's great. I mean, well, yes. So, I mean, you know, you didn't have a lot of utility bills when the walls were being knocked down and put back up. I just sound like a broken record. The, the buildings are in high, in high use and in high demand, all of them, right. especially on the school side. And, you know, if you go by any of the schools on the weekends, they're in full use. The field house is... The, the problem you run into there, too, is that, you know, they're in high demand, which means the systems are the systems get right. less efficient than they run in a high demand as well, too. So, you know, you could have the fuel cost be the same year in, year out, and you, you spend more to use it because your system is less efficient. Well, that spawns the question about, you know, fees. fees. Right. I mean, that's where I was going. Mean, everything circles back to fees. <clears throat> that's certainly something that has to be contemplated. You know, to your point, Kevin, you know, I, if the field house is running and running and running, and I know it is, I mean, I, you know, Except in the middle of the night, somebody's there. Right. Um, and so, at a certain point, no matter how efficiently you how efficient you make it, the wear and tear on the system right. ultimately is going to demand a certain amount of capital. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what you're really talking about is depreciable life. Yeah. So then, what you have to talk about when you build the fees. I mean, these are all you know pieces, component pieces of the equation. Yeah. When you drive those fees. Yeah, we said earlier you talked about needing actual costs. It sounds like at least on the energy side and the heating <coughs> side, you've got a great baseline now that goes back a couple of years. To John's point, do we include recapitalization in the cost basis? Um, no. if, if you go back to the birch metal field lighting discussion, yeah. uh, you cannot pass the cost of capital along in a fee. Right. right. Which doesn't make any economic or logical sense, but that's state law. <laughs> Just the operator. Right. So what, what John said is absolutely sensible. You should be thinking about it as a depreciation account. It's just that you can't recapture that. <coughs> but it's but when you're when you're when you're thinking forward, there's a recapitalization that you have to consider, you know, in the bigger picture of you know, facilities and capital expense. And, and capital is, is clearly important in different ways to different departments, but it's an integral part of the operation of the facilities department, right. as opposed to you will replace equipment occasionally in fire. <coughs> right. um, the investments we've made in capital on the facilities have significantly reduced the operating costs, and that was the whole point. Well, the part that's missing that is take the residual operating costs and forward into the fees for the the, the big thing is, too, is to keep in mind is that, you know, running a successful facility department means giving us, you know, and funding us so that we can make sure our preventive maintenance plan stays robust. And we, and we do, it's not just the state inspections that we have to do, it's the other things that we're doing that need to continue to happen, which is three filter changes a year on the rooftop equipment and the unit ventilators, boilers getting opened up and serviced every year. And I've worked in other municipalities where that doesn't that doesn't you happen. You don't do that. You're all you're doing is you're just, creating a bill right, exactly. for future, future delivery. Right. Exactly. Yourself. You're also avoiding the warranties on these measures right. as well, but not to. That's right. Joe, are the fuel costs um, locked in by contract or it's got to stand up, Mark? <coughs> Sorry, Joe. Are the fuel costs that you got built in there? Are they locked in by, do we have contracts for them? We have a contract with um, Traditions Energy for our natural gas our supplier through 2018. With RMLD, we don't have a... Yeah, that's just, that's we're a customer well, like anyone else. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Continues to be the cheapest electricity in the state, so, you know. Right. 
So are we on the front? Are we on the on the uh, in the money or out of the money on our on our forward gas contract? I haven't a clue. That's a good question. I th we're in a good. We're paying six dollars and thirty eight cents per decatherm, which um, they shopped it around in the uh, last summer, and that's a pretty competitive price from what I'm being told. As um, opposed to a pay as you go kind of exactly. This just shows the budget in terms of a comparative from last year, this year, to next year. And then we just did a, one more way for you to see. And again, that's the core facilities budget broken down. That's very interesting. I mean, Joe, what did you turn back in last year at the end of the last fiscal year? Do you recall? Do you know, you know Sharon? I don't know. Curious. I don't know. This is so different than most of the rest of the town. When you look at, you know, what you know, what money is spent in a relative. It's all, the, it's all in the tools. This yeah. all comes right out of the I mean the <coughs> salaries are, you know, insignificant sure. in the big picture of the work that gets done on the you know, and right. the, the money it takes to right. make it work. One of the things we're looking at we've been talking with Bob and John Darty about is um, is maybe you know trying to bring in work that we're outsourcing right now into the facility department, and we're looking at possible ways to do that, um, maybe through people. Um, but you know we do we do outsource quite a bit right now, and like when we know bringing the electrician was a great move because we were able to save yeah. over one hundred and forty thousand dollars a year by doing that at the time. It's interesting. It's almost the it's almost the opposite of you know. Trend is let's outsource everything. And, yeah. You know we're saying, but it doesn't seem to prove out in in, in facilities management yeah. because you keep them so busy. Right. You know, that's the key. Yeah, and we run pretty. I know we were talking about that earlier. We have three maintenance guys that do a million square feet of space. That's three hundred thousand, three hundred thirty thousand square feet per man that are, that are going through the seventeen buildings every day. So. Yeah, I imagine the software just really helps today. And the, the guys, the guys right. utilize it heavily. They enter all their time in, on, in the work order system every day. At the end of every day, they come in off the road, so we know where they, you know, they track. Yep. They, they like it. They track their own time. Yeah, it's great. Good system. This, this is as good an example as any, though, is when you compare the school and the town budgets. This is not labor intense. So that's why when you're seeing FTEs in a budget, um, the town is less labor intense. Police and fire are labor intense, but DPW and facilities are much less. Right. This was excellent report. Thank you. Very thought provoking in many ways. Thanks, Joe. All right. Thanks, Joe. Thank Any you. Any other questions <coughs> for Joe before he's done? <coughs> Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the last piece we have tonight is a quick discussion of capital and debt. And it will be quick. Uh, one of the questions asked during the summer and then in the fall with respect to the TLT litigation uh, was how we're going to pay for it. And the answer was a certain amount of free cash, a certain amount of debt, and um, I'm going to show you the impact of that debt, if you will. Oh, this is a little small. So here is, that's no, still a little small, here's the capital plan for FY18. Um, that 170,000 is an estimate. We are spending less than the, the FinCom policy by a slight amount, um, and I'm going to go into just a certain amount of detail. But I, I will tell you, compared to 10 years ago, the huge change is in facilities. You see some big numbers out here in FY 20, 21, 22. Those are all roof projects um, out here in the town side. Those are roof projects in FY 23 and 24. Aside from replacing roofs, um, the facility's capital plan is substantially less than it used to be. Um, and that's great. That's, that's the point of all the investment we made. Um, and you'd, you'd find similarly in the DPW budget especially, by replacing equipment more often, um, both in the fire department, police department, DPW, the DPW expense repair budget is much less than it used to be 10 years ago. I don't mean it's gone down as a slower rate, I mean it's actually lower than it was 10 years ago. So that's the reason you spend money on capital. 
I, I want to call your attention especially to this line item which is new called permanent building committee um, even though it's a difficult year I think it's really important that we fund the permanent building committee and you've heard some of the reasons why from them uh, we're in a position in the capital plan in FY 18 and 19 to spend 150,000 each to give them some flexibility on some projects that we've discussed and I think that's important um, they had asked for a hundred thousand more or less 75 to a hundred thousand um, And that would be the more normal run rate after the next couple of years But there are some pro two projects in particular. They're working on um, that. I think will be really important And I don't I don't know the latest update on kill uh, But I do know the latest ups update on Wakefield vocational school um, They were rated as the fourth or fifth worst school in the state a few years ago and they were just turned down for SBA funding. So that's probably not a good thing for oh, Kelton. Right. Um, they proposed wow. a new high school, 180 odd million, which I was a little surprised at. But that's apparently the going that's price the for high school. Right. That's the right now, huh? And oh. honestly, as a vocational school, oh, really? I'm sure the kids could build it for less. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I don't know the vocational school. That's how they keep it up. But that's how it's been held together for yeah. so many years. There's a huge amount of pride up we there among the students, yeah. and they have absolutely <laughs> kept it together with glue and, and, and duct tape. It's, been, yeah. it's just remarkable. So, um, do you know why they were denied? No, I just heard that. Um, Joe, did you go get to that thing? I did. Um, did they discuss it at all? The reason? I don't know if they knew then. They didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, I just heard that a couple that's, days ago. That's a stunning development. Mm -hmm. say we, yeah. I mean, it's a big number, but still yeah it's it it is, it is, it is, it is expensive as it is because of the type of building it is it's a vocational school the shops and the labs they need to build so right the price tag is a lot higher and the msba reimbursement rate i don't remember what it was it used to be whatever the highest rate of any community which is usually chelsea which would have been 90 percent but they've definitely passed some change of rules where it's going to be less and if they didn't get funding this time, it was going to be 10% less in the future. So they really wanted it this year. And have, have we inquired what kind of, you know, where that school needs to be to get funding? Uh, no, but one of our employees is actually going tomorrow to a meeting over there. Jane Miller, former school committee member in uh, Tewksbury. Um, she's already made a contact with, I don't know if you remember, Marie Ferrari was on oh, yeah. FinCom. Oh, yeah. 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 She's now the uh, assistant treasurer at the Vogue School, so the two of them have already hooked up and had discussion. Mm -hmm. She was our rep for the school committee for a while, too, right? So we'll get some uh, good intelligence back about that. A um, couple other pieces of equipment in the facilities department, school department. Um, you can see that this is a pretty light repair schedule for school buildings generally. A lot of what um, Joe described is done in the operating budget. We've had discussions recently about whether we should move some of this into the operating budget. I don't know yet. But there's the big roof numbers. You know, without the roof repairs, there's almost nothing in this capital budget. Yeah. It's because they're doing a good job. That doesn't mean things won't happen and they won't need money. But it's not planned out as knowing they will need money. But the classroom furniture, there's 65K. What's, is that just a refresh? Uh, let's see where it is. Top of the screen, just roll by. Yeah, I'm looking at the individual schools, though. Uh, I don't know why I don't see it. Which category was it under? This is the total for all schools, and it's then below schools. it is the individual yeah. schools. Okay, so it's not a singular. Product. It's a total for all schools. Oh, so this one, this is for the current year, 65,000. Yeah, Let's yeah. see where it was. Whoops, well, did I miss it? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Parker. I don't remember. Joe, do you remember what furniture they were buying? Yeah, and that's actually, <coughs> that's, for, that's for a few different locations. But that's okay. To replace some furniture in the schools. Okay. It's but where classroom else? furniture, yeah. It's, so it's it's categorized under Parker, but it was delivered to Parker. Let's say oh, that. okay. <laughs> I don't know. Similarly, on the municipal side, here's a total of all the municipal buildings. And again, again you see roofing here. Uh, and then this thing out here, I believe, is a rehab of the dispatch center in the police department, scheduled for several years from now. Um, it's, we explored regionalization for a long time. It's clearly not going to work. It was actually going to cost Reading money. It might have still been worth it. Um, there's no appetite for it, apparently, in this area. And I'm not sure the chief can talk to you about that tomorrow. So in a general way, um, TLT settlement is a capital expense. 
Um, you'll because it's tied to a capital project. You'll so see that, that because we had to borrow money for it, yeah. we look at debt and capital together. That's just the way to pay for capital. Cool. Right. right. So we're doing less capital. You haven't seen the impact yet. It's in recreation. Well, you've seen some of it, but it's really in recreation. Is that pushing out the turf fields? Uh... Um, here specifically is the turf fields. Actually, the two turf fields at the high school are, are in need of repair. Um, in talking to them, it, it yeah. can't go much longer. If you let that go, yeah, you you're going to lose the fields. You, yeah, you tend to double the cost of yeah. the replacement, yeah. or the fields go out of service. Was so it replacement costs? Or uh, yes. So yeah. if you look at uh, not next year, but the year after, the track for 150,000, and this is the main stadium field for 550,000. Um, they prefer to do that one first and to do turf two second for whatever reason they discussed. Turf two is more expensive because it was done poorly the first time. Right. They should have turfed out to the fence. You remember that little grass strip on the edge? Yeah. Well, that's going to all get ripped up and done the proper way. I so that's going to be, that's not, a, that's not a maintenance issue, that's a redo. Um, that's correct. There are maintenance issues, but they've kept it going as long as they can. And uh, correct me, Joe, if you remember, but the turf fields when they were sold to us were advertised with a certain lifespan that is definitely not what has happened. They, I think they said 20 years, and realistically it's 12, 10 to 12. 12 years. Yeah. So from now on, we have to realize when we buy a turf field, it's, you know, well, it's and programmed I, obsolescence. Plus, we use it a lot. Yeah. It gets, and this comes back to the capitalization right. tied to use. You can't really you tie know. that, you right. can't take that charge out there even though people would pay it right um, because of the nature of the of the product but John are they improving the technology by which they build turf fields? oh yeah I mean it, you know every year that goes by that you know that turf gets better and we actually had one of the first iterations of it we did it's a better yeah. for well and, and it's interesting in the southern climates they're moving back to that progress. Can we do something um, wrong here where it's worn out prematurely, Jeff? Jeff? Can we do I'm something sorry. wrong here where this is worn out prematurely? I, I think it's more of a use thing. I think it is too. The DPW does a good job of maintaining it. They have a contract with it and also. And you know, you're bringing in those little, you know, the pellets, the little pellets, pellets are in. Yeah. And you see that that maintenance is going on. Mm -hmm. But I think it's. And I've seen this on other fields in the area that are high use, either high use or low maintenance. I mean, those, it almost doesn't seem to matter. If you have great maintenance at high use, you know, you're going to have a shelf life for that stuff. And if you don't have the maintenance and you have to use, they, they're like junk, you know, in, in, in no time. And you can't do it in the same year because you need a field that runs right. So, so we haven't seen the impact in this capital plan yet. Well, here's here start, starts the impact, and it's albeit it's a little obscure. This is Parker, and this is a new turf field at Coolidge, which used to be three to four years into the future, maybe. Yeah. Now no, it's, it's not even close. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, no, forget about yeah, it. That's it's just off not on the horizon happen. somewhere. Right. So there, there's a direct <laughs> impact. Um, playground programs not a problem every year, um, and then all of a sudden you see a pretty pretty much an absence of other capital and recreation. Birch Meadow lighting and phase two still to be discussed with the rec committee, whatever their schedule is, I, I honestly don't know. So that's a possibility. But all these other improvements were scheduled in the next couple of years and they are pushed up five to seven years. So here's the most direct impact. And, and frankly, and this was discussed at length with John Feudal before he left, um, he said these are all nice to have. They are not, the turf is important. If you want to have a field, well, you got to replace it. But these are not essential. And what's missing from there is a lot of the capital that um, private partners have yeah. put in, and there, that has been substantial in a lot of the recreational. Facilities. I mean, the youth baseball is, you know, they, 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 well, they youth do baseball, those, uh, Reading baseball club, they Reading do those baseball. fields every year out of their own capital. Well, and not to mention the maintenance that goes on that that happens on a regular basis, especially on the baseball fields. Um, because those guys just step up that you know there's been capital expenditure on their own equipment even, you know, so that they can maintain them. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, so what I learned at the budget parents meeting last night is that the, the kids or rather the parents do 
chip in and are going to be chipping in more user fees for uh, athletics. The, At, in the way athletics. I understood it was athletics and activities. I'm sorry? Athletics and other activities. Yes. Yeah. 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 John was going to be But for the band. fields, it would be yeah. mostly athletics and uh, band, marching band. Um, there will be increased user fees. So the, the kids and the parents are, are uh, shoulder. Yeah, but that's not, those, those don't cost those the cost of the fields. Those are just for the no. kids participating. Yes, in the no, that's program. That's all program related. No right. capital involved there. And that's not new. That's just become more onerous. Right. I mean, that, you know, those, those user fees have been in place for quite some time. Yeah. And that doesn't even begin to mention all the friends of organizations, friends of the band, friends of baseball, friends of, I mean, they literally, you know, those, those private alliances contribute unquestionably hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of a year um, to help sustain those programs. Um, quick question, Bob. The, um, the field improvements, it looks like you have spread out over a number of years for uh, Kellum drainage and paving. Uh, explain a little bit about what we're um, going to be doing there. The shading there is actually, it, it's a little hard to see in black and white, but. The $350,000 project was scheduled right here in the yep. current year, and it's now moved out to here. So the shading is actually showing you how so it it's changed. Just sliding. Yeah, it's sliding it out. So, so that was another one of those, if you will, nice to haves that we just couldn't afford to do. Right. So you moved that to 20 Partly influenced by the fact if you're going to rebuild Killam, you're not going to do all that work. That's right. exactly that why I was asking the question. Wouldn't that be yeah. part of the school project? If, if there is a school project, is a school I, project I would project. certainly ask for it. I don't think the MSBA would pay you for that, but. But even it still, you, done you wouldn't do it, even if they're not paying for it, you shouldn't do it now. Well, that's a project. Yeah, that's a project we tried to do, <clears throat> we couldn't find a contractor to do it. Yeah. That's right. Not that when, long ago. Oh, that's, that's right. right. That's within the last two years. Yes. Um, so if I'm reading this right, the Hunt Park was already budgeted this year. So I that's say that's something Hunt you have to move forward on, the Hunt Park? Yes. Yes. The, the disassembling and the reassembling of the playground? Yeah. Is that so that saying? has to happen? Um, because we budgeted. I think, have year. we already actually bought yeah, this stuff? Exactly. I think we've already signed it. I think it's done. It's already in the middle of it. Yeah, I, I yeah. think that the, you know, the, the contract for the equipment and so forth was done, and at that point, you don't want to put it in the warehouse. I mean, you know, okay. and in addition to the fact that its utilization in its life <coughs> as it existed, I believe, you know, was really coming to its end. I mean, at least that was my understanding. I, you know, um, I not on the recreation department. I, you know, I mean, I'm liaison there, but I've heard a lot of discussion about that over the course of the last year. Okay. So. There. Okay. As a parent, I would say the playground was fine. So I, I'm just wondering why we're spending forty-five thousand to replace the playground that didn't necessarily. Well, I mean, it come, what it comes back to is <coughs> this is capital expenditure, and I think that there's a sometimes you've got to almost. At least I, I can't speak for anybody else. I have to step away and remind myself that capital money is a totally different, comes from a different pile, if you will, than the budget money that would make a decision on what programs you could do at school or what you could do with public safety. So, you know, this is money that's earmarked, and Bob, you're going to have to help me on this, but in a separate way from the operating budget. It is. Um, <coughs> By policy, we spend 5% roughly on debt and capital. So if it, you weren't doing Hunt Park for 45000 you might be buying a pickup truck for $45,000. Um, it is it's all the same money, but it's designed to be an investment in infrastructure to prevent costs in the operating budget. And it's it's done well over the years. We're really doing well. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of the year. Yeah, and so, yeah. so that is not... That's a, in, in the big picture of how money is expended based on the revenue base that comes in, that is not detracting from anything that goes on in the school or in public safety. It's thank you. Yeah. yeah. Now, and and to be fair, that's a policy. It's it's not a rule. It's not a law. Yeah. But um, 15 years ago, the town let recreation, or I'm sorry, let capital go down to um, about fifty thousand dollars a year total. And as a result, the operating budgets got squashed with costs because stuff was breaking down. The high school was in terrible disrepair. Um, it ended up costing more by being short-sighted about capital funding. But that's always a temptation of saying, you know, let's just spend a couple hundred thousand, let's spend 500,000 less in capital. 
just this year. Um, and that's a real tough discipline question because you can do anything for, for one year pretty much. And if there was a one-time operating cost, you could say, let's not do as much capital. But if you're going to be hiring staff, they're not a one-time cost. So that's the balancing. And, and in forecasting cost, if you use if you use a capital expenditure plan like this, it's so much easier. As Joe was pointing out, I mean, he has such a great degree of predictability as to what his costs are going to be in facilities, and it's tied to how you're able to understand and manage what's going forward. And having a capital plan, <coughs> you know, on the finance side, actually helps you to do that to, to measure your costs. It's it's like preventative. In a very simplistic way, it's like preventative maintenance on your car. It's really it's strange, you know. Good preventative maintenance prevents <coughs> swapping the capital budget, and managing the capital budget keeps it out of the operating side. So it's really kind of symbiotic in that regard. You really have to do both, and we've done that here. Yeah. Did we um? I did mean, some question for, for chairman of the finance committee, but we, we did such a good job with capital that did we decrease the five percent to? We have we have for two years, and we have proposed. I am proposing to do that for a third, probably in a fourth year. So we have four percent now. No, it's I think four it's and four and three quarters. Oh. quarters. Um, remember that as I what's in front of me is debt budget. A lot of debt capital is already spent as debt. That's the sunk cost, if you will. We've already borrowed right. it. So when you talk about changing what's left, um, I think we're spending you know, three percent in debt, two percent in capital. Let's say. So you don't have a lot of flexibility in the capital plan as it is. So if like you were to cut, you know, if you were to go from five to four, you're basically doing half the capital spending you otherwise would have done. But I think what we actually did is we didn't change the policy to lower the number. Right. But what we've done is just kind of observing what's happening, where we are, and the opportunity to have a little bit less. DBA from the policy. Yeah, yeah, so so we're, we're, we're right. teetering, but appropriately now because we said, okay, we are clear here. For a year or two, we can do it this this much lower, not changing policy. Yeah. Um, and the, and lastly, I, I do want to just explicitly show you. Here's the cost of TLT litigation. So, it, in addition to the rest of the construction fund, plus free cap totaling right. three million, um, on page Munis budget page seventy. Um, next year, the high school settlement will cost us three hundred ninety thousand dollars as an estimate. We haven't sold the debt yet, but that's an estimate. And it'll decline to 300000 over 10 years. We'll pay it off in 10 years. That's the debt service. So that's, that's, that's a cost, again, that you know wasn't necessarily budgeted for or expected until relatively recent months. But, but we and would have spent that money on it, something yeah, else. And, and that's a, the exact point is this would not have gone towards <laughs> firefighters, police officers, right. teachers. It would have been recreation. It would have gone to recreation capital, yeah. some DPW. All, all, all of the opportunity costs. Cap, yeah. All the, the opportunity costs are not going to move it out because of this settlement. And so, yes, you, you know, you're not taking away from the capital. <coughs> however, you're clearly taking away from the capital infrastructure. Um, investment and you're clearly increasing the cost of whatever that project of whatever that project's going to be because in some cases <coughs> it's about 10 years so God only knows I mean that project could go up by 50 percent um, in that window of time so the opportunity cost is enormous and one area where Reading is actually in good financial shape is at least one um, here's our debt service inside the levy for the next 10, 15 years. Um, it's $2 million next year, but it goes down to almost nothing and then does go to nothing. Um, that's unusual. We tend to borrow for shorter periods of time to pay it off, to right. not pay interest. Whether that's good or a bad idea, at least it gives us future flexibility. That's it. We have. That's all we have for debt, Jeez. other than outside the levy. That's, that, that's 10 years. That's Bob, where does it go to zero? I don't see that. Um, 28. It doesn't, but it stops well, right here. 2029 is okay. the last uh, projected cost. So again, sticking to the 5% more or less, a little bit less, um, has really, really been a good thing for the town over the last 10 years. It's really helped cut our costs, uh, and that was really uh, important. I, I do think uh, someone made an observation that we've done such a good job. This litigation aside, I would have felt much more comfortable backing away from 5% and needing the 5%, that's probably brought us right back to needing it, unfortunately. Yeah.
Um, but, you know, again, there'll always be more projects. Um, the ones we know about that are larger are, are thought to be debt exclusions. We'll see. Don't know. Killing <laughs> certainly would be a bigger enough number to be a debt exclusion. So other than the TLT litigation, um, is there, are there any foreseeable needs where we're going to be borrowing within the levy, like big numbers? <clears throat> Let's see if I've put any in. Um, the only one I've actually put in here is that Birch Meadow Phase 1 lighting through two, three years from now to revisit it. That's something we can't revisit in the near term. <coughs> yeah. But that there you see it right there. Okay. Uh, one and a half million over 10 years. That's the only one <clears throat> I've got in there. There's some other things you see here possible not added. Um, cemetery garage building is still in the capital plan. Um, these other ones are not. <laughs> DPW, there's no number in there. Kill them, there's no number in there. Again, those are large enough to They'd be just as that yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> so and you know, we're what are we about seven years out on the high school debt exclusion? Eight years? Um, right here is where it ends. And how about the library? It's about the same time. Year, year before. So yeah. within ten years. So right here it goes away, whatever year that is. Let's see. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, that so is that, really a bright so spot. That, that really is. Our debt profile is very good. About yeah. yeah. Now, water and sewer, a little bit longer. Yeah. That's a different sort of story. <laughs> um, but, you know, a library. Get people going on the water well, and sewer. Yeah, we'll we talk that about that later in the week. <laughs> um, you know, a library, the useful life of the library is, is hopefully, I don't know, 50 years. Now, I think under state law, we certainly couldn't have borrowed for 50 years, but we could have easily borrowed for 20. Mm -hmm. right. And most communities would have. It's a tough call. It's a philosophical one about, do you want to spread your cost over 20 years worth of users? That's a reasonable thing. But I offset that with your paying another five or $600,000 right. in interest, yeah. why bother? Right, so even though the current, you, even though the people who are living in town now are gonna be paying the brunt of it, yeah. they also get the benefit of projects that we can now afford to do that we couldn't have. That's exactly right. Less. That's exactly yeah. right. So it evens out. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. So that, uh, I think that wraps up tonight. Um, tomorrow again, you'll have a badge pinning ceremony for us. I don't. I don't think there's a badge paper at this time. I'm not sure. <laughs> That's a surprise. <laughs> I got oh, I see. I see. No, 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 I got I'll, I'll bring my kazoo. Put it down to you know a fife and drum. So, is there any, anything else anybody wants to add, either from the public or so just, the assembly? Just, just yes, before we adjourn, um, can, can we just um, go over our schedule again in terms of? When we'll be discussing certain things and, and sort of, you know, it's, it sounds like we'll be discussing as they come up, and then the major stuff on the twenty fourth. So is that yeah, you, unless you, we need you one do have that. time on Thursday to do some of that. It, it's hard to know how long a presentation will take. Right. I would not suggest you go into any depth in philosophical issues on Thursday. Take some time to think about it. Right. Um, you could start the discussion on Thursday though. If you want to have a fee discussion. Um, you'll have heard from all the departments about fees. None of, the, none of tonight's departments really have right. fees. Right. right. Um, you'll start to hear that mostly from Gene. Um, and is, is the 24th a, a somewhat filled, or is that just kind of a pocket right now? Where it's um, right now, you will have a busy agenda till 9 o'clock or so. And so at 9.15, I think I earmark the rest of the night for two and a half hours. So we may, you know, we may even decide that we want to add something in between Thursday night and the 24th yep. yeah. for another meeting. Why wouldn't we pick that tonight? Also, we have a financial forum though coming up too. Yeah, you want to talk to Mark? I'm not sure he wants to hold that. So the financial forum is the 25th. Mark, is that correct? It's the one. You're talking about or questioning if that is worth having. Okay. Can we recover? Actually, I may, if I could suggest, I think it's actually a perfect time to have that because the schools have already gone through their budget, or at least presented it before. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll have gone through at least the, you know, um, yeah. hearing through all of us. And, and I think well, we will have gone through Bob's budget. They yeah. went through their budget. Right. But I mean, we're, so. You know, we're it, a little bit more of a bystander in that role. Right. But, it, but it's, you know, the budgets have now gone through. The pain has been, di you know, diagnosed and presented. And, and that's a good time to get all the boards to kind of like, let's get together. Because we have a work closing when? Uh, February 21st. Yeah. 
February 21st. Need to advance that discussion. Warrant or whatever you got questions. No. Right. Yeah, you, that's, yeah, that's a deadline you can't skip. Right. Right. I, you know, I don't want to speak for FinCom, but Mark did talk to John Doherty and I, and, and the question was, what would FinCom accomplish that, that day? I think you get, we'll have the trustees, we'll have the school committee, we'll have the selectmen. <coughs> it's like, okay, it's all out there. Let's all, let's throw some ideas out. What do we, you know? But it's already been hatched over. It's, it's already too late yeah, but, this year. Huh? You know, the question is, are you going to ask FinCom to go from a million to two million in free cash? I hope not. No, <laughs> no, no. no. But There's not a lot new to talk about. Everything will no, right. Is it already kind of done? I think what you would get, the positive side would be you have all the boards together. It would be the first time all the groups are having a discussion. It's more of an integration session than a financial right. forum. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. So Although we'll financial forums, that's ten, ten to be what we do. <laughs> well, the first one sets the thing. The second one is we figure out what we're doing. Yeah. You're, you're describing an internal working meeting, actually, rather yeah. than something for the public to opine and get feedback and get information. All that has already been set up by each of our individual board. Right. So I guess, would, again, the, the plus side would be it's another chance to have a big public meeting. That's, you know, if there's value in that, if we think we'll get new people to come or people to discuss issues that they have to hash out with, that's a positive. Um, but in Are you talking of, about the public? Yes. Now, these, these meetings are on TV, which is great, um, and people are attending. It'd be you know, lovely to have more people coming, obviously. We'd love to have that. Um, but, you know, these are some tough decisions that are, that are coming out by each group right now. So we're, we're, we're flexible to have it. I think the concern would be just make sure we have an agenda that is helpful for everybody. Right. Well, uh, sometimes, at least what we've been finding over the last year or so, maybe a little longer, is that a discussion period that is less driven by a stipulated agenda, I mean, broad topics, rather than this is what we have to get done tonight. I mean, you know, the whole idea, and I think that's maybe what Barry is, I don't want to speak for you, Barry, but we find as a board of selectmen that we get a lot accomplished in a little bit more of a free-form discussion. Maybe that's a night when that could happen. Um, I mean, you've got everybody in one room. You know, you're going to, uh, the, the public will have had the opportunity to both hear all of these nights. Um, they will also have had the opportunity to hear, um, they've heard, you know, the presentation of the school budget. Um, they will, the night before, um, we're certainly going to set aside the tail end of our meeting to, you know, um, create one of our conversation periods, you know, on all of these topics. Um, because, you know, we've been asked to by the public. Right? We want to be responsive to that. Um, I mean, the public sent us a clear message, you know, in the fall, and now the public is sending us another message, and they're saying, please consider this, please consider that. And, I, you know, I think that's kind of, we need to do that. So maybe the 25th is a good day, I mean, because we'll have, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm we'll inclined be, to say we'll starting is. our discussion at 9, 9.30, you know, and by that time, a lot of people. Yeah, we won't go to. past midnight. Don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. Including yeah. us. So that's what I'm saying. You know, we may, we may so want to have one before the 24th as well. I think that's a good idea, because if we put it, pick the date, we could decide Thursday if we still want to do it. Right. That's, yeah, that's true. We can decide Thursday. We still want to throw another date out there. So we'll get two, two more Tuesdays in between now. 24th, is that right? Between now and the 24th? One. No, it, just, it would just be the 17th. The no, you have one. I don't think they're going to need an extra meeting and a financial forum. So. No. no. See, I, yeah. I think we can accomplish it there. I think we're, you know, if yeah, I could. It. What yes, I can tell you that's interesting um, is that there's a lot of, I mean, I'm getting texted even during this meeting. There's a lot of discussion that isn't necessarily coming forward. It would be great to get it out you know, more in public. Well, I mean, so you do have to follow a certain level of, I mean, this information has got to come out. So, I mean, there is some limitation as to how far into the, into the week we can go. You know, right? I mean, this is, you know, the department heads gathering this way is, is critical to create those other conversations. So, you can't stray too far off, you know, as I said, in the right So, Bob, did you have something? Yeah, after, um, you know, a, 
let's say after a storm, um, one of the things that Greg Burns is especially good at is not letting us recover from the storm without first talking about what did we learn. Um, so the next day, Move everyone's tired and everyone's cranky, and he drags us all in there. See, Paul's smiling back there because he knows it's true. <laughs> um, and, you know, when something's fresh in your mind, that's where you do forward lessons learned. So I think the 25th would be a really good time for the public and the boards to discuss, okay, we discussed an override. What did we do well? What didn't we do well? How were the communications? Um, the fact that, I have to say, the school and the town budgets that you're seeing is what was discussed last summer. Why are people surprised? You know, that's just a fundamental question to be asked. Um, did they not believe it? Did they not hear it? Um, I don't know. There's no, there's no way to know the answers, but it's not a bad time to get together and have that discussion because there will be another step at some point in the future, whatever it is. So maybe it's lighter on presentation. Absolutely. Longer More on discussion. discussion. I'd yeah. say no presentation. I think that's yeah, to get the presentation. I, know I mean, I, you, need a little, you need a little presentation to get the ball rolling, and right. then a set, of, a set of guidelines. A on guideline for discussion. Yeah. It'll take yeah. some engagement. Honestly, it'll take on its own life. We, we could do a 10-minute presentation from the listening session to remind everyone what it said. Yeah. And then you'll see some similarity, a couple differences. Again, things aren't so quite as bad. So I can show up 10 minutes late since I knew that for Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, those of us that went to all those know, but clearly there's part of the community that did not know. Why? Yeah. I don't know why. I, it, it wasn't for lack of effort. I yeah. know that. Um, maybe it was for lack of attendance. Maybe it was for lack of attendance. It was for lack of engagement. I'm not, but as Bob points out, you know what's what we've heard tonight, and what you know what was heard last night from the school committee. I mean, that's their budget. It's not far afield from what the discussion was last summer. I mean, I mean, nobody was crying wolf um, last summer. Yet, you know, the voters made a decision as to what they wanted to do, and they told us what we have to do. Here we are. Um, so, um, I do think that the 25th should stay in place. I think it's all the, the whole discussion idea is a, is a good one for all concerned, all parties. I assume, I assume we're here. We're we're you have have to so. Let's yeah. use the library, Amy. Is that available? Oh, that would be cool. Oh, that would be cool. Sure, we have a program book that night. <laughs> well, we can collect the ten bucks. The library closes at nine o'clock. <laughs> and then it's just the custodial piece. Um, so, uh, I was wondering if it should go there. And, uh, so take care of I love hearing that charge. Uh, yeah, so. By the way, it is a great venue. I've been to a couple of small community meetings. Uh, would you like to? It's probably a little quieter than this place. Yeah. I really want to go there. For more conducive to discussion. So many Even empty seats in here tonight. I'm, I was shocked at the yeah. amount of yeah, empty really. seats in here tonight. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Super. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. had literally. We thought it was going to be a big. I, 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 I agree. People were tired from the school committee. Frankly, that's really shocked. You had more public last night for 40 hour zoning. Than you <laughs> right. did. We did. Budget. Last we did night we budget. had a meeting here in concert with CPDC around zoning and marijuana discussions. And there were top of, three that's or not top four of times the amount of public participation <laughs> in those discussions. I, it's hard to predict. You know. um, I mean, thank you for coming, and there were some other folks here as well. Um, anyway, we'll figure out. Right. We'll figure out. I think it's an itchy feet in the room. Motion to adjourn. I have a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Nice. We're out. Uh, all right.